to it. First up, a fresh look at the use of hormone therapy as a treatment for menopause and why some women are still hesitant. NBC's Maria Shriver has our story. As a treatment for menopause, the data on hormone therapy is unequivocal. Researchers call estrogen and progestin a first-line therapy for common and debilitating symptoms like hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, and pain during sex. Hormones reduce a woman's risk of osteoporosis, urinary tract infections, and type 2 diabetes. And top medical organizations say for most women under 60, the benefits of hormones outweigh the risks. Still, surveys show more than half of menopausal women won't use hormone therapy. Scared off, say advocates, by an NIH-funded study called the Women's Health Initiative, or WHI, from two decades ago that they say dramatically overstated the risk of hormones. That study really misrepresented some of the facts. Dr. Sharon Malone is a veteran OBGYN and chief medical advisor for Alloy Women's Health, a leading menopause health care company. She says the WHI study, launched in the early 90s, looked at hormone therapy in postmenopausal women over 60. In 2002, researchers abruptly halted the study, citing evidence that older women who took hormones had a slightly raised risk of serious diseases. But the message to the public was far more alarming. Take this 2002 segment with a WHI researcher on the Today Show. You actually found heart disease, the risk increased by 29%. The risk of strokes increased by 41%. Invasive breast cancer risk increased by 26%. So what are we telling women, the 6 million women in America today, who are taking Right. HRT. And not only the six million, but all those women who every day as they reach menopause have to make a choice of what they're going to do. It was horrible. There were headlines in the New York Times about the horrors of hormone replacement therapy. Patients came in and they felt betrayed. It can be a dangerous spot. I mean, but Dr. Malone says those risks were vastly overblown everything. and didn't apply at all to women under 60 who were still in menopause. All of the things that they said, the breast cancer, the stroke, none of those things applied to younger women. It only applied to women who were older. What should NIH do to correct the record? What NIH should do is hold another press conference if need be. The most common reason why women avoid hormone replacement therapy, it is the fear of breast cancer. So we went to the NIH for answers. In some women with Dr. Janine Austin Clayton is director of their Office of Research on Women's Health. The change that women today want is they say, look at 20 years ago, NIH left us thinking that hormones were bad. NIH should bring us up to date on the new evidence about hormone therapy. Is there, that going to happen? There's a lot of new evidence. Discussions like we're having are the right way for us to get to as many women as possible. All the women who were on hormones at that time were taken off. It left women thinking that if they took hormones, they'd get breast cancer, heart disease, or all of the above. And that's wrong. So it answered a question that was designed to answer but it did leave other questions unanswered. I understand that led to fears about menopausal hormone therapy. We now know for women close to the menopausal transition that hormone therapy can be safe and effective for relieving menopausal symptoms. The benefits can outweigh the risks. She says the NIH never meant to mislead women about hormone safety, but go to their website on hormone therapy and you'll still find a list of studies focused on the health risks, not the benefits. Does this need to be updated though, you think? Happy to review that and see if there's new information that needs to be added. We want women to have information that's current to make their treatment decisions. Now to a, to a truly incredible conversation with music superstar Demi Lovato. She opened up to Savannah Sellers about her own mental health journey and the importance of asking for help. I found something that I deal with now is anxiety. I've dealt with depression, I've dealt with addiction, I kind of have a checklist and I've just kind of knocked them all off. Global superstar Demi Lovato does not shy away from sharing her darkest moments. There have been times where I've dealt with depression where I have had suicidal ideations and it's something that I've struggled with 
since I was very young. And it's something that I can still struggle with if I don't stay on top of it. Lovato made headlines in July 2018 when a drug overdose nearly took her life. She shared the previously unknown details in a YouTube documentary, revealing just how close to death she came. I had three strokes. I had a heart attack. Was that a hard decision to make, to be that open? It wasn't a hard decision for me because I've always been an open book. The very first time that I went to treatment was when I was 18 and I went for my eating disorder and I went for self-harm and emotional issues. And I, when I came out of that experience, I was faced with the decision of either keep your mouth shut and not say anything or share your experience, strength and hope with another person in hopes that it affects them in a positive way. And I decided to go with that route because I wanted to help others. I wish that I had had somebody when I was 13 years old. I wanted somebody in the public eye to say that, hey, this is what I've gone through and you don't have to choose that route. What do you want the 13 year old who's watching you now to know about if they're not okay? Talking to people and asking for help is more than okay and is absolutely what you should do. For Lovato, limiting her social media intake was key. It got to a point where I realized I can't read anything because if I read positive comments, it feeds my ego. And if I read negative comments, it damages my ego. And ultimately, I don't want to navigate out of ego at all. What would it be like for you, do you think, if when you first started struggling, you had the internet the way we do at our fingertips now? And how damaging do you think it is? I think it's so damaging. I think that we live in a world of editing and Facetune and all these things that can change the way that we look. And it's hard to grow up in a world where that's right in front of your face and at your fingertips at all times. I grew up in a period of time where young Hollywood was very, very, very thin and that was the look. I think that had a really negative impact on my mental health, which I think fed into my eating disorder. Today, Lovato is focused on strengthening her mental health and pointing others to that path by being transparent and putting in the work. I don't want to paint the facade that everything is totally perfect yeah. and, and fine, but I am in a really good place and it has been kind of challenging to write a <laughs> happy rock album, <laughs> but I'm doing it. But I have bad days. I had a bad day on Sunday. I realized that even to this day, no matter how happy I might feel and seem, I'm human and it's okay to still struggle even when you're in a great place. Is this as important a part of your life as the other things that we know you for, being an advocate in this way? It's arguably even more important because music, music, yes, it can last forever, but careers don't. Life and legacy is what's important, but the things that I'm most proud of are the fans that share their stories with me and say, you've saved my life. And that to me is more important than any award that I could win. Up next, we're going to introduce you to some small town doctors who are banding together for their patients. Plus, what you need to know to keep you and your family safe this summer. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Health and Wellness Today, with a closer look at some doctors who are facing mountain challenges and struggling to stay afloat in small town communities. Here's Kate Snow with their story. For Jennifer Bacani McKenney, Fredonia has always been home. As a kid, she rode her bike around the small rural Kansas town, spending time at the small practice her dad ran for 31 years. I saw that he was um, doing something special for people and connecting with people on a very personal level. Anything for you, Doc. Oh, I'm just going to keep you alive forever. 17 years after graduating from medical school, Dr. Jen, as some of her patients call her, is now running the family clinic and is one of the only doctors in town. I thought about just being able to take care of people who took care of me when I was growing up, and that was really kind of what made the difference in, in deciding where to go. Her patients, more like family, and her practice, a lifeline for many in her community. Dr. Jen has been multi-generational for my family. If you didn't have Dr. Jen, where would you go? I was seeing someone in Tulsa. So that would mean um, two hours. Two hour Chicago. drive? Yes. For many private doctors across the country, that close personal bond with patients is what keeps their practice going. Dr. Naraj Sharma is a pain doctor in a small suburb in New York's Hudson Valley, north of New York City. Any pain, you let me know. She was just about the kids, the wife, everything. She knows yeah. about your family? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like you're just a number going in and out. Sharma sees anywhere from 10 to 20 patients a day, but the financial burden of running her own business is taking a toll. I'm HR, I'm the office manager, I'm the administrator, and I'm the doctor. And some insurance companies are paying her less. You're not what people maybe think of when they think of a doctor driving a fancy car, making a lot of money. Yeah, that's definitely not me. There are some injections that I perform and we get $54. You spend more on a mani-pedi than you do to see a double board certified interventional pain management doctor. How do you make ends meet? I don't take vacations. <laughs> I'm the only doctor here because if I had to pay another provider, I might as well close shop. Nationwide, the number of doctors who work in private practice is on the decline, now around 49%, down from 54% in 2018. And according to a recent analysis, nearly 70% of all doctors are either employed by a hospital or a corporation. Experts point to an uneven playing field. Compared to a big medical group, small practices have little to no bargaining power with insurance companies. Private doctors often make a fraction of the salary for the same kind of work at a hospital. But Sharma thinks joining a larger network could compromise patient care. When you find a good doctor, it is. It's kind of emotional because <laughs> you, you place your trust in them. I love my patients. I feel that when they leave here, they're happier than when they entered my office. And if I can do that, hey, I think I'm doing a great job. Back in Kansas, Dr. Jen McKenney is pushing for more visibility. She's banded together with other private doctors in the area, sharing resources and bargaining with insurance providers as a group. McKenney also works at the University of Kansas, teaching and recruiting students into rural medicine, a job she says is incredibly rewarding. You know, I, I have a long road ahead in Fredonia and yeah, no plans to go anywhere soon. Coming up, we are going to answer your questions about summer safety. And then later, how a man is helping people find peace and joy with some simple tips that we can all learn from. That's right after this.
Welcome back. Summer is here, but before you run out into the sun, there are some important safety tips to consider. NBC News contributor Dr. Natalie Azar recently answered some, some common questions from you about summer safety. All right, so we got this for our first question comes from our viewer of ours. This is Lauren in Georgia, and, and uh, this is something we're going to hear about more as we get into the warm weather. Georgia. Every summer, my kids and I always seem to get heat rash. What is the best course of treatment, and how do we prevent the heat rash to begin with? So, so Natalie, before we, what is heat rash? Well, heat rash, it's also called prickly heat. Have uh -huh. you ever heard of this, yeah. right? So it's when you get these little tiny raised bumps on the background of kind of irritated skin. It's a very, very normal thing that can happen. Um, we do have tips for treatment and prevention. We're gonna, so think of it this way in terms of preventing. Heat rash, heat is in the name. So you wanna do things that are going to keep you cool. So what does that mean? We're talking about staying in an air conditioned, cool environment, mm -hmm. drinking plenty of water, wear you know loose layers not excess amounts of clothing you want to avoid too much physical exertion and take cool showers or baths and it follows that the treatment tips are very similar to sometimes the rash can be itchy so you can use antihistamines either topically or take them by mouth you can also take a cool bath or shower you also want to avoid excess sweating and humid air you can use oatmeal oh, and you can do this that. yourself you can you can make a paste yeah. or you can put it in a bathtub and uh -huh. soak and then of course you want to see your doctor if you think it might be coming infected if you're scratching especially little ones uh -huh. draining redness increased pain so use that overnight oats and just get right back in there <laughs> i've got a twofer <laughs> right back in there uh this next question comes from emily right here in new york city hi dr azar i love working out but now that it's getting hotter every day i was wondering what are some ways to make sure we are staying properly hydrated ah. Such an important yeah, question, yeah, yeah. right? Right, Emily? So I think the biggest thing to remember is that if you start to drink when you're thirsty, it's too late. Mm. I remember uh, taking a hot yoga class, the yoga teacher saying, you need to hydrate before you get here, right? So the way to do this is you wake up in the morning, and by the way, this is if you're doing a lot of outdoor yeah. activities, right? As soon as you get up in the morning, you want to start drinking water. Again, if you wait until you're thirsty, it could be a little bit too late. You want to drink roughly about eight ounces every 15 to 20 minutes, but this is important. You don't want to go over 48 ounces in an hour. That's about a quart and a half because too much of water mm -hmm. can also not be such a good thing. You want to avoid alcohol, but a lot of people have a misconception that caffeine is dehydrating. It's not. If you're drinking oh. a coffee, you're drinking a soda, that also gives you water. And then have you heard of the urine cold Oh, yeah. Test, right? Big fans of that. You know, I a, have not. A well hydrated body mm -hmm. will make a very light clear or very light yellow pee. Yeah. But if it's dark orange, dark yellow, that could be a sign Some of dehydration. dehydration. That's a quick and dirty litmus mm. test. Okay. All right. This next one is from our very own researcher. Hey, Nick. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Azar. So with summer around the corner, I'm looking forward to getting outside more, going on some hikes. But what should I keep in mind to keep myself safe from ticks? Oh. All right. This Nick. is a whole yeah. thing, right? It's a big tick season. It absolutely is a big tick season. Remember that ticks love tall grassy areas. So if you're walking on a trail, make sure you're walking in the center of it. Always use EPA registered repellent. Perform daily tick checks on yourself and on your loved ones because they can hide out in sneaky places. You want to know how to remove a tick quickly, correctly, and you want to prevent your ticks on pets. Right? You want to talk yeah. to their vets and make sure they wear their collars and everything because they can bring it inside also. Uh -huh. Still to come, meet the man who started a mindfulness movement to help people live better lives. Plus, a former NFL player on a mission to make sure everyone has access to mental health care. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. Taking care of our mental health is just as important as taking care of our physical health, but not everyone has access to those resources. Podcast host Case Kinney is doing something to change that. He talked to Chanel Jones about how he's helping others lead more intentional lives. For 35-year-old Chicago native Case Kinney, the key to mastering mindfulness is to talk about everything. So how does one become a mindfulness author? It was just kind of one of those points in life where I was like, it would be really unfortunate if I were to look back in 10, 20, 30 years and realize that I was doing things, dating people, working a career that really wasn't true to me in a sense. So Kay started the New Mindset Who Dis podcast in 2018, a place where he could challenge himself to work out his day-to-day -day problems. I realized what I was doing, which was I was practicing mindfulness. It, you know, kind of intimidated me, but it's basically just the art of being present and being judgment-free to yourself so that you could find clarity in some form. As he kept posting, Case's listeners grew, and with the podcast now totaling over 30 million downloads, Case has since used his platform to challenge others to talk it out and put their own mental health at the top of the list. I love the focus on mental health, conversations around mental health, it has are having in culture and I like seeing more men come around to it so I'm excited a couple years from now just to see how many people are practicing their own form of mindfulness. So the fact that it was so successful did you expect that? The fact that it resonated with so many people and continues to resonate with so many people really surprised me I, but I think it speaks to the the larger need in culture and society that I think a lot of people really want to do these things they just don't necessarily know how to get started and they need a, a relatable first step. Wanting to provide folks with that first step, Case created guided journals with titles like Unbother, But First Inner Peace, and even Single is Your Superpower. Journaling is so powerful because it's bringing a thought from your mind into your hand, into a pen on paper. Your latest book is called That Bold of You, about letting go of what you're not. It came from a lot of the feedback from people who listen to my podcast, who have said basically something to the extent of, I feel like I'm too much or I'm too difficult. So I call it the book that's bold of you because it's a bold thing to push back on the labels that have been given to us. A few years ago, he also started posting his words of wisdom on Instagram. I've kind of become known as, as a quote guy. So I've just realized that there's power in writing these silly little quotes, putting them up around Chicago or Miami or New York, and just reminding people of these things that we intuitively know, but maybe hearing it in a different way, maybe hearing it said in a slightly different version. That's what makes it click. And they've clicked with more than 480,000 followers, including the likes of Lucy Hale, Haley Bieber, and Viola Davis. I'm also impressed with like how creative you are. I'm like, oh, a coffee cup. That's a good place for yeah. a quote, like just right there. So I was like, what are things that we touch and feel? So I started writing on coffee cups. And then I was like, well, yeah, I've got more to say. So I need a little <laughs> more surface area. So I started doing paper. But for Case, the biggest reward is making a difference in the lives of others. People have said that my words change their life or help them get out of an unhealthy relationship or find their soulmate or just be happier, uh, which of course I can't take credit for. You know, they're the ones doing it. But hearing things like that is just so powerful. And I think that is just an amazing thing to witness. And just like Case, former NFL player Ryan Mundy is also shining a light on mental health. I recently sat down with him to talk about his own journey and his new mental health platform, Alchemy. I accomplished my dream in my hometown and won a Super Bowl there, right? And I've made money and I have insurance and I have all these things at my disposal and I'm still not okay. Ryan Mundy, an eight year NFL veteran, knows a little something about playing with heart. What he did not know was how to deal with all that was happening inside his head. How did you get into football? I started playing football at the age of seven. After making All-American at his Pittsburgh High School, Ryan played four seasons at the University of Michigan, then one season at West Virginia before the NFL came calling in 2008. It's quite rare for someone to get drafted by their hometown team. It was quite surreal. I used to go to Three River Stadium and take donations for my Pop Warner football team. And I would see the players pulling up in their fancy cars. And I was like, one day that's gonna be me. Ryan became a Super Bowl champion with the Steelers in 2009, going on to play six more seasons in the game, including one with the New York Giants and two as a Chicago Bear. Being a professional athlete, we all know the, the discipline that it takes. Yeah. And then of course there's the, the physical aspect of it as well. 
There's also a mental aspect. Yep. What kind of toll did playing take on, on that part of, of Ryan Monday? I developed a really high tolerance for pain and being in uncomfortable situations. And that's great, but then you have to acknowledge, hey, like I'm not okay, or I'm not feeling like myself. And in that sport, hyper-masculinity, sometimes that's a difficult conversation to have. I've heard that oftentimes NFL players face a bit of a, an identity crisis when they decide to hang up the cleats. What was your experience? Very much the same, but the NFL offers these executive education programs that I was taking advantage of. I even got an MBA at the University of Miami, Florida, all while I was an active athlete. I was dealing with anxiety, I was dealing with depression, I was dealing with identity issues, and smiling on the outside, but struggling on the inside. And also during this time, my family was going through a list of chronic conditions. And so I reflected back on like my exposure in the venture capital space, where a lot of money flows to solve big problems. And I didn't see any money flowing to solve my problem or the problem that my family was going through. In October 2020, Ryan launched Alchemy, a mental health platform designed to meet the needs of the black community. Why is there such a glaring void in the mental health care space for the black community? Finding culturally intelligent care, folks who can understand your experience, really challenging proposition, less than 4% of psychologists are black, less than 2% of psychiatrists are black, but then also mental health and wellness support is very expensive. Alchemy aims to even out the playing field of mental health practices, offering content from meditations to courses on relationships and more from clinical experts that look like him. I think we have gotten to a point where we talk about the need for therapy. And the reality is, a lot of people who need to do that, they don't have insurance or they don't have a job. First of all, where they can leave for an hour in the middle of the day yeah. or they can afford it on a regular basis. Therapy is a luxury. But how do you fix that? We think about innovative approaches like, okay, well, what are we calling therapy? Things can be therapeutic that aren't necessarily therapy. Changing deep-rooted ideas about mental health may be harder than playing pro football, but Ryan is hopeful. You've got two kids, I've got two kids. One of the things that I, I always worry about is they seem fine on, yeah. on the outside, but I don't know yeah. what's going on in here. How do you make sure that your kids are mentally healthy? Yeah, talking to them. They didn't have an opportunity to see me as an active NFL athlete, uh, but now again, they have a front row seat to what it looks like to be a black entrepreneur in America, right? And so like, particularly, I gotta walk the walk. And so like, I meditate with my kids. I talk openly with, about my kids. Uh, we make sure that they have the things that they need for them to be the best and highest version of themselves. That's gonna wrap up another episode of Health and Wellness Today. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time, right here on Today All Day. Over the years, I have been lucky enough to step into the Today Show kitchen and watch the best chefs from around the world teach us some incredible recipes. We had made that pesto, which was, oh, exactly. darn. Like, you know, I almost got out of this one clean. Cool. <laughs> Turn it down. Oh my God, I had one job. None of which I mastered because I didn't know the first thing about how to cook. But those days are behind me for good, and I'm finding some confidence in the kitchen. Now, my friend and all-around superstar, Drew Barrymore, and her chef, BFF, Pilar Valdez, are gonna teach me a few weeknight favorites. We're gonna be making a watermelon salad with pistachio duca and shrimp scampi with bucatini, both from their cookbook, Rebel Homemaker. I am so excited to be cooking with these ladies today, so let's get started. Drew and Pilar, I need to know everything you know. Well, I know that I love you. I know that I love you. She really does, and we're so excited to be here. What's the plan, Pilar? So today's plan, we're gonna cut the watermelon, pickle the rind, prepare the duca, assemble the salad, cook the shrimp and pasta, make the pan sauce, plate, and serve. So first up yeah. for our watermelon salad, we're gonna break down the watermelons. I do love a good piercing, but now of course I'm stuck. Oh, this is good. Wow, this Boom. Is... Savannah, you're doing great over there. Oh. It's not Don't a competition. Mad. Look at the difference between our two heads. <laughs> Look at your melons. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Put the other half That's what I was aside. thinking. Why are we so juvenile? <laughs> I don't know, but when that's we why we're such good I know. Okay. I see how this episode yes. is going to oh, go. Yeah. You're going to lob off the top of it. We're going to just take off the dark green. 
Mine doesn't look anything like yours so does. So what Pilar. happened with yours, Drew, is that you didn't. Um, you took off. You were overachieving. You took off the skin and the rind. Um, but our first step was just to do uh, the skin. So Savannah, you can continue on what you were doing, and okay. now we're just taking off the rind. So exactly okay. the same kind of oh, okay. sawing and shaving motion downwards. Okay. And now are we keeping it off. this rind? We are, because that's what we're going to pickle, oh. actually. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take your watermelon, and you could cube this, but for this salad, mm -hmm. I actually like to cut it in irregular shapes. I feel good about this part. Yeah, that looks really good. Yeah, it does. So you're going to take your rind, rind basically, yes. and we're going to uh, dice it. Okay. You're going to flip it over so it has, yeah. Savannah, I can see the claw coming out, which is really good. I'm trying to learn. You want to tuck in those I like digits. to cut like this. I do too. <laughs> I'm like, I like to lop off And this would Thickness. be a dicing, this not is a, a dice. mince. Nope. Because What's it's pretty What's the difference chunky. between dicing and mincing? Size. So the, absolutely. Size, size matters. <laughs> I'm going to take a sip on that. What are we drinking? This is so good, by the it way. Is so what good. is it? It's a mocktail. It's a version of a Pimm's. It's based on a Pimm's cup, which is usually with gin. But this one is oh, without. We would never know there was an alcohol. <laughs> Oh hair. my gosh. Drew what is loves, that? Very gingery, right? Yeah, so there's ginger beer, and Drew, I know you love tea, so it's a combination of black and rooibos. Okay, that's a very unique flavor. Yep. <laughs> it's okay. So good. All right, so wait, what do right. we do now? Pickling anything is a flavor profile that I really love. Oh, me too. It is basically uh, equal parts water and apple cider okay. vinegar. So, Savannah, so three fourths cup that. water. Mm -hmm. Three fourths cup water. Three fourths cup apple cider vinegar. Got it. Mm -hmm. And then one you can actually, um, and then one mm -hmm. exactly. Ooh, I like the honey equal bear. parts um, a lot. Yeah. It's just such an easy brain yeah. yes. ratio to remember. Yes. Yeah. Let's add in uh, the salt. What, are you sprinkling it on purpose? Uh -huh. or are you just trying? <laughs> no, I am because I don't like the dump. It's yeah. like, then you have to work harder to get the solubility. If you shake it in, I feel like it's just a better That's method. actually a very good pro tip. And right. then Drew, I'm gonna have you add in the fennel seed, which is on top. Half teaspoon. Half seed. teaspoon of fennel Please. seed. Honey. Lovely. Sprinkle on in. <laughs> uh, you got crazy. I usually do. Half teaspoon uh, coriander There you go. I'm and we're going to do half a teaspoon of the cumin. Oh. And then the last thing is half a teaspoon of the pink peppercorn. I love pink peppercorn, and I especially love it on green dishes. Yeah. Oh, Savannah, okay. have you had pink peppercorn? No, I before? have not. So they're really, and you can actually take a little and take a little bite, and they're like very fruity and floral. Oh, yeah, but they're peppery. not super, a little peppery, but not as pungent as a yeah. boss. It's gonna basically come up to a little bit of a simmer. Okay. And as long as the honey and the salt is completely dissolved, then you can pull it off. Drew, you're gonna carefully pour it into our one cup okay, of she water. Too well. Well. She's like, you know that graceful <laughs> ginger side of yourself yes. that you don't have to try <laughs> to right. tap that to it. You're just pouring it right over. Yep. Then what happens? After 30 minutes, this is going to be good to go. It's like so easy. Super easy. That's pickling. That's pickling. pickling. Boom. Boom.
we're moving on to the pistachio dukkha component of our salad. Okay. Dukkha is an Egyptian condiment. It's usually a blend of like nuts and seeds and spices. You okay. should have some coriander, coriander. seed. Mm -hmm. Two teaspoons Two of coriander seed. Okay. Is this, is this the cumin? That's cumin. Okay, mm -hmm. Ooh, absolutely. Going off, oh. going rogue. Okay, then it's She's one, rogue. One now, quarter so cup sesame seeds. Hold, hold on the sesame oh. seeds. Actually, Savannah, so you're going to toast that Can we first. turn it up? How high should it be? Um, let's do medium. Okay, Okay, and it's an empty plate. There's no oil or anything. No, absolutely okay. not. You want it in a dry skillet. They have skillet. oils on them, right? Yes, they do. So they're starting to release it. And you just have to shake it occasionally, not okay. constantly. Okay. Um, and. You're gonna notice a change in color. They're gonna start to get a little darker, but really what you're looking for, Savannah, is the smell. Okay. It's gonna start to like release this like toasty smell. You're gonna smell the coriander. It's gonna mm -hmm. be very floral. It's starting. Can you smell yeah. it? Yeah. Let's give that a shake, actually. Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah. I can. Ooh, I like it. And yes. on the average, would you say about two minutes, Kalar? About two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Take it off because okay. I can see a okay. little bit of heat. Let's okay. turn oh, yeah. off the oh, pan. Yeah. Okay. Now what? Um, and you're gonna divide actually the spices between your and Drew's mortar and okay. Havzi, Havzi. What I like to do when I have spices is that instead of go in and like bash immediately I kind of like to muddle so a circular motion and that helps it break down because okay. if you go in and you're bashing it's yeah. gonna like firework spices okay, so everywhere. I'm like just kind of stirring so, yeah can I start smashing yes now? I think so and you can apply a little more pressure to Savannah am I trying to get this to like a very fine grain? pretty pretty fine so with the duca we want a little bit of a mm. play on texture so you'll have fully ground pieces and then some pieces that are just more broken up so I'm happy mm -hmm. with where mine is at how do you like mine? What do you think? Beautiful. Oh, Lovely. That's good. good. Yeah. That's and nice. I think you you guys can both pop uh, your spices, Savannah and Drew, into that bowl. Okay. Into one bowl. Into one okay. bowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yours is nicer. And think. that's really nice because then you guys have a, a uh, texture. Yeah. Yes. Play on I texture. went hard, you went soft. Uh, well. So now we're going to toast the sesame seed. Okay, we need one quarter cup sesame seed. So mm -hmm. just let it go in there. Unlike, yeah, you can shake it a little, you can use the spatula. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All right. Sesame seeds, as soon as they start to change color, you want to take them off the heat. So keep stirring that, Savannah. They're going to go golden really, really quickly. I can okay. smell them, so I think we're almost there. Okay. And you definitely don't want to burn them. No. Burning bad. Yeah. Okay. Burning bad. <laughs> well, Savannah is uh, toasting the sesame seeds. Drew, I'm going to have you add in um, our salt. Our That's flaky a, sea salt. Is this a maldon? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's a One. tablespoon into that bowl where your spices are. I love a maldon. I do too. It's so different I than other salts. I put it on salts. top of my chocolate chip cookies. Yes. yes. Nice. Look at you. I did not know. A little baking skill. And then Drew, you're going to do, um, those are hemp hearts or hemp seeds. Two tablespoons. And hemp seeds. Savannah. Yes, they're really great forms of protein and fiber and vitamins, actually. Okay. And again, it's like we're playing a lot with textures. Yeah. So that's a really lovely addition. Your favorite, Drew, half a teaspoon. I would say, Savannah, maybe 30 more seconds on that, and then we're going to be good. Mm -hmm. um, a pink peppercorn okay. and just a smidge, a smidge, smidge, smidge of black pepper. Okay. <sighs> smidge. That's more there, than that's a plenty. smidge. That's definitely more than a smidge. Wow, you have a hot. <laughs> I love <laughs> spicy pepper. Tongue. Everything okay. could be coated and rubbed in pepper. All right, do you think we're good on these seeds? Let me see. I feel like they're mm. almost there, okay. right? They're almost turning golden. But <laughs> <laughs> like, um, we need music. <laughs> All right, okay. I think that looks really good, Savannah. Okay. So let's uh, turn off the heat. Dump them yeah, in. Dump it in. And now we have the pistachios. I can just kind of like Absolutely. do this like Savannah, Julia Child like stuff. That's great. You're kind of rocking back and forth. Am I making you proud, Pilar? You are making me so proud. This second. <laughs> I'm actually going to stop you guys right there because I really like the two textures that we're playing with. Okay. Savannah's on like a finer and then Drew's is on a rough. So I think we're, we've established this a This is pattern. a really good combo. <laughs> we're going to scoop all those nuts into this bowl. Scooping the nuts. Yeah. Pretty colors too. Really, really pretty. Yeah. And Drew, you're gonna give it a good mix. No pistachio left behind. There. No pistachio mm -hmm. left behind, please. Okay. That looks amazing. Yeah. And I'm busting out something here that I was told. It's a gold box Savannah's tasting spoons. Do you have special spoons? They're just special because you're supposed to taste your food. Did you know that? I didn't. And now I do. 
So just take a little. Take a little, and and then we can sort of play from there. So mm. it's gonna be, it's gonna have that floral from. Yes. I like it. I wouldn't yes. change one thing. Would you? It's it has perfect. enough salt, enough pepper. It, it really, really does. does. <laughs> All right, success, ladies. The love story <laughs> continues. We made duka. We're gonna assemble the salad, but when we're plating it, it's gonna be a little bit of a friendly competition. Ooh. And then. Let's go. You guys got this. All right, okay. so in your little jar um, is a simple lemon vinaigrette. Okay. It's just lemon, olive oil, salt, and pepper. Okay. And it's separated a little, so just give them a little shake. Mm -hmm. It emulsifies it, which is there you ever go, so Drew. important. If anyone's doing an oil and vinegar salad, emulsify it first, it'll taste 50 times better. Okay. Wrap in your knowledge. All right, so in your bowl, you have a little bit of arugula. So I like to coat a little bit of the bowl. I know it sounds crazy, right, Savannah? But You're I'm not going to use to, all of that. No, so. you don't have to, and you dress the taste. But when you coat the side of the bowl, you're basically not dumping it on the leaves. And then now we can start building. Okay. So a little arugula on the plate. Remember, oh. you're making something beautiful. Okay. okay. A arugula on the plate. This is where the competition. Comes. Yes. Okay. So and what's then our next one? Your watermelon slices. You're gonna dip it in the duka. Oh, dip it in the duka. And however you want to <laughs> dip it is up to you, and you're going to lay it yeah, on you, the plate. You duka you. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So you're just dipping those watermelon slices. And oh, I like to leave a bit of it without the duka, just so that it has that freshness, and then you'll get the pop. Oh, so the some crunch. duka and some don't. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I'm actually asking. I feel like this should be like late night comedy. I know. I know. Just <laughs> cheesy, like Rodney Dangerfield. But right, uh, the best. Okay. Here, there's no rules. Okay. Don't forget to finish also with your pickled watermelon rind. You can scatter it around. How can I win? What if I make like a tower? I know. You can totally way, make I'm a tower. Thinking of a tower. A little like time. Jenga. Okay. And then you can finish with a little bit of Maldon salt also, okay. which just like brings all those flavors together. I learned from little that. Salt Bay Maldon salt. Oh, I love it. I don't know. Shall we uh, Vogue, <laughs> Vogue for the camera? Yes, let's, I think we know who's his best. It's yours. <laughs> this looks very pretty. Really? It, it really does. I like I your th little tower. I feel like they're both they're both pretty. They, I also feel like these are three very extremely different, different approaches. <laughs> yeah. You went like just Put it on the plate. No, actually, I feel like yours has like a, um, a, a, a Lines, strategic right? pattern. Yeah, no, it does. And yours is sort of abundant, <laughs> and mine is amount. I love it. All, All right, right. Shall cheers. We, shall we walk? Yeah. Let, oh, cheers, let's it, guys.
we're doing one of Drew's favorite recipes. Scampi. 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 Who's I... going to devein and have their way with those shrimp? Well, they actually are already peeled and deveined, although Drew is killer deveining them. <laughs> All right, but we've got the water boiling. We've got the water boiling. Did, did we salt it like the sea? I love that. Say it again, Savannah. I, salt it like the sea. Thank you. Okay. So Drew, what I'm gonna have you do actually is season the shrimp. So that's actually baking soda. Mm. And so we're gonna do just a quarter teaspoon, Drew, and you're gonna sprinkle it all over the shrimp. And the reason why we do baking soda, mm -hmm. I love it, is that it basically helps no the shrimp brown and get this really beautiful color. Oh, okay. And then we're gonna do salt and pepper mm -hmm. on your shrimp. I feel like you should be doing this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've seasoned it with salt and then we'll uh, give good. it a good toss. I love okay. a little flour, a Look little it, I egg learned. wash. I'm shimmying yeah. my salt. No not dumping over here. Yeah. No, not anymore, I'll never dump a again. Little. So we're gonna let the shrimp that has salt and pepper and baking soda sit for about like five or 10 minutes. And meanwhile, we are going to attack our garlic. Okay. Um, so today we're gonna slice the garlic fine. We don't wanna crush it because that's just gonna burn in our sauce. Mm. So what I like to do is just take the tip off. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of brownness. And you're gonna spin it, we're gonna cut it lengthwise. Not okay. Fast. You have some olive oil. We're gonna do three tablespoons. Happy to eyeball it. There's also a measure if you'd like, but. Well, they, like, I've been encouraged to eyeball. I so I'm gonna try. Eyeball. I think this is. One tablespoon. I think that's good. Two. Yeah. Three. Beautiful. Do you agree? Yeah. Kind of, sort of? That's really, really great. And then you're just gonna rock Our it. Our baby's all grossed up. <laughs> She's <laughs> eyeballing! I, I eyeballed. Okay. okay. And what you're gonna do, Savannah, is add the garlic. Mm -hmm. Put it right in there? Yeah. You don't want too high of a heat no. and to end up like me who burns their garlic. And okay. Drew, you're gonna add the red pepper flakes. Okay. <clears throat> and having enough oil helps you not burn the garlic. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many? Half a teaspoon, so just that measure. And if you want things spicier, you can go more. You, you know, know she again. does. Miss Spicy over she likes. It's gonna start to change color. It's gonna go kind of translucent, translucent. and sticky. I, I have feel it like in... you can start pulling. Okay, um, you do this. So we were just whoo, um, infusing the olive oil mm, basically with that garlic and pepper okay. uh, flavor. Okay. Okay. So what? Throw this in. You're gonna throw it in, and then you're gonna give it a good stir. And we're using bucatini, um, which is basically like a, a thicker spaghetti with a hole in it. Okay. Um, but you could use any sort of long shape of pasta, and you're gonna cook that pasta until just al dente okay. because we're gonna finish it off in the sauce. Okay. Um, do but sauce. you're gonna lay the shrimp down in a single single layer, okay. and you're not gonna stir it, you're gonna shake it, you know, lay occasionally, it lay it down, yeah. Actually, will you hold, Savannah? You don't think it's hot enough? Yeah, so. Stand back. How are you, what are you looking at there. to know if it's so hot enough? So you want a, a little bit of ripple, you do not want smoke, we're not okay. like, trying no. to. And no bubble. <laughs> Wait, let me. You want that sizzle and you're not getting it. Oh yeah, it. I'm definitely wanting, I can see it a little bit here. Let me, can I borrow that? There you go. Here you go. There oh. you go. There you go. Oh. So let's start. Yeah, Here interesting. You go. I stepped away. Everything started <laughs> functioning. Meanwhile, my arm is going to fall off. Um, holding these. Oh, kind yeah. Of that, you know what? I hear what you're talking about yeah. now, Pilar. Yeah. There's a decade. That's sizzle. why she wanted to hear this. No wonder. Yeah. All right. People always talk about, talk about cooking, you know, like smell and what you can see. I'm mm. always like, I'm like, I can hear my water boiling. I can hear it sizzling. Oh. Like, I like that. She brought in the strongest sense of them all. <laughs> exactly. The color will start to tell you when pink. it's cooked. It starts to get pink. Its and tails are already it. pink. Yep. Do it's, I need to flip them over ever? Not yet. You know yet. what, let's, I think it's a little too early, but you, let's peek at one and basically the color will have changed and it's gonna have a little bit of like kind of, sp ooh, okay. That so good to me. A little more. Okay. And you can give the pan a little bit of a light shake, but we're not, you well, don't mess with them. Don't not string, yeah. them. So, Savannah, when you flip them, you're going to kind of move them to a different... Okay. Uh, They're going to go different, different, different spot. There moving you a different go. neighborhood. Yeah, because it does, you know, some stuff a will have dip could I know. I'm going to have you add two tablespoons of that butter. So that's one, one two, two. Beautiful. Just into that pan. Uh, Ooh, now lovely. we're talking. The reason why we put just the two pats of butter right now is that you're basically starting to build that flavor. Right. You touch it with your finger right now. 
You see Pretty how firm, firm it is? Yes. Okay. Is that a good thing? That is a really good thing. Okay. So we're almost there. So we're just gonna rescue the shrimp. Mm -hmm. Take them out? Take them out, leave the butter in and cook in. Okay. And oh, they're, I... they're basically like That's almost it. done. Mm -hmm. We're gonna finish them off with the pasta and the sauce. Drew, will you actually, speaking of pasta, stir. I've forgotten. Um, please stir it. Test and it. then maybe just uh, try a new, no, very far. Nowhere All right. near. All right. Hard as a rock, <laughs> al dente, stiff right. as a board. This is like, can I, pencils? Sure. Uh, that's great to so. No, that's, oh yeah. So in this little carafe here, mm -hmm. we have a uh, white w wine. Wine, okay. Dump it in. Dump it in, and then you're gonna take your wooden Ooh. spoon. Deglaze? Deglaze. What is deglazing, Savannah? Scraping the nasty bits off the bottom. <laughs> the yummy yes, bits. The bi I know, the flavor bits. Yes, absolutely. I did learn a deglazing. Um, I love that. All right, you're gonna do, um, not the all that butter, actually. You're gonna do four more tablespoons, basically. One, yeah. two. Oh, look yeah. at you eyeballing Three. it. Yeah, it's impressive. Four. All right, and that goes into the pan. Look at yeah. This is hey, right here. Duty. This is graduate school. <laughs> We're gonna dump in the cooked garlic, all that oil, and mm. the chili. We're gonna let this go. I want you guys to taste it. Where it is, there's Savannah's golden oh, the box. Golden spoon. But you so have there's one. no lemon yet. It tastes lemony to me now. Really? Oh, from the white wine, right? Oh. And that's gonna reduce and cook. Oh my! What God, do you think? Oh, it's incredible! <laughs> I'm actually just gonna come in mm -hmm. with this lemon juice. So it's two tablespoons of lemon. We're not gonna do all of it because I want to do kind of to taste. Mm -hmm. So let's start there. Okay. I think. What do you think over there? Uh, that, that. No, not done. Still not Although, done. Well, actually, I'd like Pilar to test this. Because happy to noodles keep cooking. Yeah, and, and we're gonna finish it off in the sauce as well. So this maybe might something. actually be Pretty almost good. there. Mm -mm. Still one more minute. Yeah, yeah, almost there. Should I turn it down? So more? Yeah, let's turn it's that really down. going crazy yeah. here. And how's that here sounding now, Pilar? <laughs> yeah. Now we got that's it on. the sound I want. I like to pick herbs too for like yeah. salads, but oh. for something like this, I'm like, no, that's totally fine. Okay. So you want to get it again. What'd like, you do? Did you cut off the stems? I put the stems underneath. So I cut oh. them, cut the stems. Mm -hmm. See, by the way, I'm oh. grabbing this like before this? Yes. I forget everybody. And then tuck them so under it. Oh. oh, she's saving her pasta water. <laughs> oh, I like your today show theme. Pasta water. Okay, and then I put the stems under. So, yeah. So yes. I know it's uncomfortable, but yeah. just like you okay. can go slow and you're going to do a rough Because it's ready. Okay. Drew reports that the pasta is All right. Okay. And Savannah, you're going to start putting that pasta in. Mm -hmm. And it's Ooh. totally fine that it has the liquid because yeah, that's just going to make a, a, a nicer emulsified sauce. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Look how beautiful that is. Oh my sauce gosh, this is, looks right? incredible. And I think you do need a little bit more pasta water, Drew. Would you oh, think? Just, aren't you just glad a you little, saved it, a Drew? Little bit, a touch. Give me a little splash. That's okay. great. Wow. Yeah. And is the shrimp just the very last thing I put on there? Yes. I like this big old skillet yeah. too. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Makes me feel like a real chef. Um, Savannah, you're gonna kill the heat. Okay. Done. And then you're gonna garnish with your chopped parsley. Right in the bowl, huh? Right in there. And I don't want to go crazy, right? Just a little like that. Just a just a little for color, and then okay. you can give it a toss again. It's with the, the shrimp oh gosh, is it looks so good. Perfect. <laughs> like wow. it's ridiculous. And Perfect. how are we gonna plate it? We got a bowl for you. Okay. Now, okay. This, part, this is gonna be a little tricky. Um, because this thing weighs six billion pounds. Oh, watch out! Watch out! Okay, look. I think we did pretty good. Cool. Oh, yes. I think we did perfect. Look at it. Wow. And then you. By the way, roll. I feel like you should lie in King that now. <laughs> the ball. Oh! <laughs> wow. And then you can serve it with a little bit more fresh parsley, chili okay. flake, lemon. Okay. Garnish. Love it. Do. Garnish it up. Just a little bit. We, yeah. we chopped those. Let's go. Yeah. Guys, shall we? Let's chow down. Ah! Let's do it.
beautiful does this look? I mean, this is our garden party. It's so pretty. It is really, shall we? Yes. Okay. Please. My first Dooku. I've never had a Dooku before. Dooka. The Dooka. <laughs> exactly. It's so good. Mm. You really get those spices. You do. It's delish. In the back of the palate and through the nose. Mm. But mm. it's so cold and refreshing. Also, right? And then you have the pickle that comes through that is just like I a little it. floral. Listen, I love that pickle, Ryan. Yeah. I never knew I could feel that way about a watermelon, Ryan. I'm really excited that you're saying me that. Me too. To this that is though. a whole new world for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you um, some people call it a nest. Um, I'm really going to focus on the pasta. If I catch a little shrimp in there, for you. I catch a little shrimp in there. So be it. What are we doing? We're going to make a little round ball? Well, you're supposed to make a pasta nest, but this is not working. And then oh. my tongs also won't go all the way to the... God darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, oh, you know what will really help? Let what? me try this again. Let me get it with a fork. Okay. Because that... Um, like a fork I feel oh. like this is going to, yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. should work much nicer. Want to nest there me? you go. I want to nest you. Okay. Oh, that's so pretty. And then you just kind of dip the ladle. There you go. Oh my gosh. And fancy then you pants. can unfork it. And then a little bit of shrimp. You're so classy. <laughs> Here. Thank there. you. Yeah. <laughs> third All right, time. I need it. Third, third time's a charm. I believe in you, Drew. Okay. Let's so. see. I oh no, you're okay. nesting. Oh, there That's you your go. best nest yet. There you See? go. Third time's the charm. Oh, and that then... is beautiful. That's so pretty. Oh, there you go. I'm chowing down. I can't wait yes, anymore. Yes, yes. This is delicious. Mm -hmm. You guys cooked that shrimp like perfectly. The shrimp came out real good. Real right? money. Yeah. Perfect. I agree. Money shrimp. Proud of us. And that like little pop from the shrimp mm. too, that baking mm. soda like really affects the texture. So it feels like super fresh. It does. Ladies. I'm so proud of us. Can we raise a glass? To your friendship. To your friendship. To your friendship. Cheers. Welcome to The Boost. Today we are sharing stories all about the people making a positive impact on their communities. From a program encouraging black men to become teachers, to a company bringing flowers and opportunities to Chicago's vacant lots. First up though, a woman in Ohio spreading warmth and kindness at the Cleveland Clinic. Take a look. Meet Peaches. Hi, Chris. I'm Peaches. To some, she's Patrice Houston, but on the skyways of the Cleveland Clinic, she is simply known as Peaches. I've been Peaches all my life. When I was born, my father looked at me and said, she has a fuzzy face and rosy cheeks. I think I'll call her Peaches. And where are you headed oh, today? I love helping people. Always been a part of me. I think that's my calling. 22 years ago, Peach's daughter Latrice urged her mom to apply to be a patient transporter at the Cleveland Clinic as a way to give back to the hometown she adores. She loves coming here. <laughs> she loves coming to work. It's hard to say that it's work. And we're going to the garage, right? Okay. Peaches is just an extension of the medical staff here because you feel safe, you know, when you see that same face day in and day out, and it's always got a smile on it. This time we'll go for Peach Cobbler. You got it. Every day she come to work and she cheerful. She never downed. She's like the mom of this place. She does it all in the trusty shuttle she named Bessie. I call myself the Cleveland Clinic Uber. <laughs> Bye-bye. See you later. Everyone here is here for a reason. And when they're here with me, I want to make them comfortable and let them know everything is going to be okay. From dropping off patients at follow-up appointments to escorting them to the cancer center, Peaches is there to help make their quarter-mile journey a little less scary. You come up here, you feel lost. She'll just tell us how her day is and how ours is. It, it kind of relaxes us. She goes fast. <laughs> There's a lot of anxiety, believe me. <laughs> It is a big comfort. And she's such a light, a shining light. And shine she does with more than 40,000 rides over the course of her career. Her impact is immeasurable. You're dealing with folks that are not having the greatest of days and that just never affects the smile on her face. You know, her ability to just kind of roll with that and then 
help brighten that person's day where by the time they're done, you know, with their interaction with Peaches, they're no longer having a bad day. We don't know what the patients are going through. I just want to let them know I um, extend my heart to you. For Peaches, she gets as much from the patients as they get from her. The impact that the patients have on me makes me humble and make me grounded. I don't like what I do, I love what I do. So I can't imagine myself anywhere else but here. Bless you. And thank you and bless you too. We are delighted. We are so happy to have Patrice Houston Peaches with us today. Uh, yes. Boy, you are such a bright light. I can see what you're giving to all the patients. What do you get by taking care of them? You know, it, it just makes me proud that I can make someone happy and it's just me is what I do. You know, I think sometimes we forget about all the helpers. Mm -hmm. They come in so many different ways. You know, mm -hmm. you, you drive a golf cart, but you also see people at their worst times mm -hmm. and their best. How do yeah. you try to spread joy? You know what, with a hug. Mm -hmm. I, I spread my joy with a hug. I stand my heart and, and give them a hug. Cause sometimes I need a hug, you know? Yeah. So I, I think it's really cool because you can see how scared you are when you enter a hospital, we all know it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there's not usually someone to comfort you in that way. It's mm -hmm. like, go to this place, get that test. And you talking, you even share your own stuff with them. This is how I'm feeling today. I can tell how you put those patients at ease. Do you recognize that? I recognize it because I've been there before myself. Mm. Yeah. I've been a patient myself. Mm -hmm. I walked in a hospital and I was literally scared. Yeah. So. I know that feeling, so I extend it to the patient. Mm. Well, do you Pe ever take time off? Yeah. No. You never, you, when oh, was yes. the last time you had a vacation? Mm, last year, I went to Orlando with my grandchildren. Aww. Yes, but I try to go somewhere every year, but I haven't been anywhere lately. Okay, okay. well, lately. Um, we think it's finally time for mm -hmm. you to take some, some vacation for yourself, okay? What about this? We are sending you on a Mexican vacation. Oh! You and a guest. Five days, four nights, nice yes. day. Secret smoke shake, Playa del Carmen. Five days. It's five days. It's a luxury, all inclusive, all -inclusive. resort. Oh! You get to enjoy the beach. See it right there? The beaches, oh! the pools, activities. And you and your guests get to enjoy a spa treatment of your jo choice. Oh, and round trip air. You're getting it all. Oh! You're going on vacation. Oh, That's what the doctor ordered. Yes. <laughs> We love you, Peaches. Oh, thank you. I love thank you, you more. We love you. Congratulations, thank you. and thank you for everything you do. Thank oh, you so much. You're All amazing. Right. Now to three mothers and their daughters leaving a lasting legacy at Riley Children's Health in Indianapolis. They are all nurses making a difference in the lives of patients. I'm Melissa Kiesling. And I'm Katherine Kiesling. I'm Peggy Payne. And I'm Sydney Payne. I'm Pam Finley. And I'm Lily Finley, and we're registered nurses at Riley Hospital for Children. I'm just kind of checking in with everybody. I have a great team I work with. We've worked together for many years. I've worked with Melissa and Peggy close to 30 years. And you can't go through the things that we've gone through and not have a special bond. Us three in particular were all pregnant about the same time. That was 1995. Lily is the oldest of the three girls, and then Catherine is the youngest. So we have, all have daughters about the same age. Yeah, it was, it was fun. These are the new cats. I never thought that they'd be working beside us. It's just, it just happened. Part of it was when Lily had cancer when she was in college, and she was a patient here at Riley. Several of my colleagues would come to see her she just was treated so well by the nurses that took care of her that I think she wanted to give that to other families. I remember the care I got here and when I had surgery here, the nurses were so comforting and understanding and made me feel safe even though I had no idea what was gonna come from it. I had no idea if I was even gonna live. There was, I don't know, 100 plus tumors they took out of my neck that day. I truly understand what it's like to get devastating news. and You don't know what's going to happen. And one of the things about the job that I find most rewarding is being able to be there for not only the patient, but those families. 
that's yeah. good. Yeah. Kat and I both started as techs and then nursing students on our unit. We didn't find out until later on that we were friends in utero. To know that like our moms have started out doing this together and then to have somebody who's kind of walked a very similar path as you, it's been amazing. Not only do I have my mom, but I have Melissa and Peggy who always are checking up on me and giving me hugs, making sure that I have everything I need. Growing up, my mom was always doing things for other people. There you go. And I've always tried to model that in my behavior and I've always really admired her excuse me, and looked up to her and so to feel like I'm kind of falling in her footsteps and making her proud makes me feel really good. Hey sweetheart. She's super mom, super nurse. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> there's good days and there's bad days in this job, especially these units. Everyone trusts you and <laughs> everyone knows that you're there to help them and you make everyone a priority. How many patients you guys have? I'm very proud of Catherine and what she's doing. This makes me very happy to know that she's part of my work family. I didn't realize how bad nurses <laughs> are. You wouldn't believe how much they can do. My favorite part of working with her is to walk over onto another unit and be able to give my mom a hug. It's been really, really awesome. Nursing's tough, especially starting out. It's, especially after 30 years too, it's always tough. So it's always tough. having those friends and people you call family to lean on is really special. Well, let's celebrate nurses, you guys. How about this? We got Melissa and Catherine. We have Peggy and Sydney, Pam and Lily. Y'all, these are the mother-daughter duos who all work at the same children's hospital. And guys, we knew that when we heard this story, we actually thought it couldn't be true, but it is. How does it feel to know that your daughters have selected your profession? We'll start here. Um, I'm very proud. Yeah. Um, it makes me happy to think that she trust from what I do that she wants to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very proud of her every day. She has rejuvenated my love for nursing as well. Oh, you know, sweet. I've been a nurse for 33 years and she's been a nurse for two. <laughs> but I've learned so much from her, oh, you know, yeah. seeing it through fresh eyes. Yeah, yeah. Catherine, um, we, I think some of us as moms forget the power yeah. of being one. Yeah. Did you always look up to what she did? Oh my gosh, I mean, outside of work, like at work, I always look up to her. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm very lucky to follow in her footsteps and do what she does. <laughs> Peggy, what's it like sharing like a workspace with your daughter? What's that like day in and day out? Oh, we love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, our normal day routine is we, on our way to work, we talk on the phone and then we meet each other in the parking lot. <laughs> We're, <too. laughs> We're best friends. How <laughs> lucky is that? Oh my God, how fun. Sydney, y'all kind of look alike. Yeah. Yeah. People say that all Do the people time. Say yes. that? Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. people, are, are there ever Confused. yeah kids or parents who are like, wait, is that your mom? <laughs> yeah, a lot of the times if I announce myself or somebody says my name, especially my last name, they're like, wait, wait. Is that <laughs> it? She's worked there for so long. She's worked in so many different areas. Areas that she's met so many people and so they as soon as they hear that that's my name they can usually put two and two together. <laughs> right. Pam, what a beautiful story of you and your daughter, your daughter who was actually in the hospital when yes. she was younger. That must have been so difficult as a mom and as a nurse. It was very difficult yeah. but she got excellent care. Um, the nurses were so sweet to her. Mm -hmm. um, they let her go out and look at the zoo and see oh. the animals <laughs> because Riley is a tower and so you can see the zoo from it. Yeah. So, wow. Lily, yeah. what, what about those incredible nurses yeah. inspire you even now? I mean, they just, you can tell they truly care about you as a person and I was 19 when I had my big surgery there and you know, they didn't treat me like a kid but yet they loved me like they would any other person who's at the hospital and gave me, you know, extra special care. Aww. You guys, this is awesome. I'm so happy <laughs> sitting on this couch with you guys. We do have a surprise for you. You've touched a lot of people's lives and a few of them wanted just to say thank you. Take a look. We spent almost a year in the CBICU at Riley Hospital with the most amazing nurses. We had spent countless hours in the Riley Heart Center. They were our home away from home. She was at Riley for over 300 days due to complications from a heart and lung defect. When I was nine <laughs> months old, 
I had a heart transplant. My nurses helped me get better. We have had the privilege of having all six of you as nurses at one point, and you have made profound impacts on Junior and my family's lives. We just celebrated eight wonderful years with Sawyer's Hero Heart, and we know that it's thanks to the Hero Nurses at Riley that we get to have these moments. Peggy, in particular, was an angel on earth. I know you're all family, but thank you for making us part of your family. We love you, and we can thank you from the bottom of our heart. We love our Riley Nurses! Thank you, I love you. You don't always get to hear from, yeah. from patients no. and their parents. How does it feel yeah. to hear that? Yes. I mean, a lot of Amazing. times we don't get to see them after they go home. No. And no. I remember taking care of them. And yeah. You know, it's just so special to see that they're doing well. Oh. Well, y'all are heroes. You guys, that's yeah. amazing. How yeah. beautiful. You're our yeah. heroes. Coming up, one man's important mission to bring more diversity into the classroom. the boost there's a program in New Orleans helping bring more diversity to the classroom by empowering a new generation of educators Craig Melvin has the story to stand at the head of the class to shape young minds which ways African Americans use World War II crisis in order to protest against racial discrimination in America teaching more than a career it's a calling, especially for Jerome Perkins. So you just woke up one morning and you're like, you know what? Guy was like, you need to be a teacher. He called you to her. Yes, sir. Jerome teaches African-American history at Sophie B. Wright High School in New Orleans. When you finally got into the classroom, do you remember what those, what those few days and those first few weeks were like? I was scared. <laughs> just like anything, it's new to me, so I didn't really know what they expect, and I, I just didn't want to be bad at it. I just didn't want to be a bad teacher. Jerome and dozens of educators like him got their start with the help of a fellowship called Brothers Empowered to Teach. The goal is to get more black teachers, specifically male black teachers, in the classroom. The most recent survey shows that black males only account for 1.3% of all public school teachers. Larry Irvin, is trying to change that. He co-founded Brothers Empower to Teach in 2014. It's a community-based education program for undergraduate college students. Fellows get funding and support. More importantly, they get real classroom experience. Larry's late mother was a teacher. He spent a lot of time in school with her growing up, but as a young man, Larry says his life went down a troubled path with two arrests leading to charges of drug possession and evading police. Larry pled guilty both times and received probation. He turned things around, and after getting the blessing of the school superintendent, he started coaching at his old high school. It just took off. That was a spark. Um, my connection with the, with, with, the, with the young guys, the head coach was like, Larry, have you ever thought about education? Because like, you would be an incredible 
a uh, teacher. Then he started teaching, but he also began studying. He wanted to understand why there are so few black men who become teachers. Why is it so important to have men that look like me and you in the front of a classroom? Kids are what they see. I don't have to go far to see somebody uh, that looks like me playing football. I have to go far to see a rapper. I can go right out my door and see a drug dealer. Education, being a teacher, leading from the classroom and from an intellectual standpoint, that's a different conversation. Since launching, the program has placed 174 fellows. Right now, they're in New Orleans and Baton Rouge with hopes for expansion. Part of the program is nurturing a network. Larry hosts a series of conversations among the fellows called The Cypher. We think, we think it from it from a collective black male standpoint, how we're viewed as a group. It's a chance for these young educators to exchange ideas, support one another, and grow. It's working for new teachers like Jerome. It's what you perceive and what you see every day. If I see this every day, that's what I'm stuck to. And for Larry, becoming the change you want to see is a lesson he was taught long ago by his first teacher, his mom. What, what do you think your mother would say about all of this? You got me with that one. She would be quite proud, I would imagine. She was my biggest cheerleader, you know, so. It was like he did it, he turned it around. To say the least. You did. To say the least. We've got more feel-good stories to boost your mood coming up right after the break. To the boost we are celebrating summer with this blooming family business a flower farm in massachusetts began with one woman seed of an idea and thanks to her loved ones it's now grown into something special dylan dreyer has the story flowers to me it just makes people happy it's food for the soul tucked away in the woods of upton massachusetts is a childhood dream come true in elementary school when the teacher would ask like draw a picture of your dream job and I drew myself picking strawberries. In a way I knew I really 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 wanted to farm. Got some monster bushes over here. Grace Lamb and her employees are up with the morning dew picking, priming and packing dahlias, the farm's signature flower. It's becoming a jungle in here. I think we're growing 240 varieties, but there's... Drop in the bucket. Yeah, that's nothing mm. compared to how many dahlias 
are out there in the universe. It's a love for tending plants cultivated at a young age in a multi-generational immigrant family. I was the one that really enjoyed helping my mom and my grandma out in the garden. That early farming fantasy was lost to the realities of adulthood. Grace went to school for finance and took a lucrative job on Wall Street. I was a equities sales trader. Just didn't fulfill me deep inside. So after four years, when Grace's team was downsized, I was out of my apartment in two weeks and I found a job at a farm. I think we all knew deep down that Grace's place was out here in the dirt. From day one, the farm was a family affair. Grace's brother Lee joined her full time. Duped. Yeah. Totally duped. Well, he's always really good at building things. He was actually the sucker. The easiest one to get. <laughs> Five Fork Farms blossomed with the help of her four older siblings and parents. Grace went from her mother's backyard to 38 acres. I don't think Five Fork would have worked, at least in this iteration, if it wasn't our family. The inn is on the right. Grace's father is a fan favorite at the farm, delivering flowers and ushering customers to their farm stand. He sees the business as an opportunity he never got growing up in Cambodia. My wife and I, we grew up having little family life because of our parents have to make livings. We absolutely don't want our children to live the life like we did. Ten years later, the farm is thriving. Their loyal customer base that's turned into family makes sure the flowers sell out every year. I would say that's what keeps us going. For sure. The joy and happiness that they bring to people's lives. I need to make sure they have that. The family grows the most amazing flowers I've ever seen in my life. It's like an outing for the kids, beautiful flowers for mom. The weather has proven to be an unruly and unpredictable business partner, forcing the lambs to adapt. We've had some sort of weather-related record every season so far. This season in particular, the major drought. And heat. Total 180 from last year. Despite Mother Nature, Grace is still planting her roots. How many times have I quit? Quits about once a year, at least. <laughs> <laughs> with her family joining every step of the way. It doesn't seem, at least to me, like work. You just keep on going. From one flower business to another, a program on Chicago's South Side is growing hope by using nature to help heal and inspire. NBC's Shaquille Brewster has more. Across Chicago's thorniest neighborhoods, change is blossoming from the ground up. This is really about trying to establish the floral industry as a new anchor industry in urban America. Vacant lots, now fully sustainable flower farms, converted by the nonprofit Keelan Blackwall and his wife Hannah founded in 2014. Uh, we have our double white tulips, we have some of our peach single tulips. Flowers that not only beautify, but empower. The tulips that grow on this flower farm are sorted and arranged here at Southside Blooms, creating jobs for young people in this community. We make bouquets, centerpieces. Youth learning floristry, customer service, and flower farming. Never in a million years would see myself working with flowers because, you know, first, this was my first time ever being in a flower shop, like being around so many flowers. Planting seeds through exposure. Why did you have that skepticism when you first heard about this job? Oh, because I was like, man, flowers. Like, man, I don't plant no flowers, I'm a guy. Exposure growing into impact. It taught me patience, like how to control my anger, how to like, you know, this is how you run a business. Like teaching Being me. out here did that. Yeah. It was like telling me, like teaching me, like you gotta actually put in hard work to mm. see yourself prosper. An impact ripe for delivery. Definitely want to be able to, to replicate this and take it to every major inner city across the United States. Shaquille Brewster, NBC News, Chicago. When we come back, we are sharing the latest viral video that'll put a smile on your face. Stay with us.
We are back with the boost with one more video that is sure to make you smile. Check it out. Everyone knows dogs are as loyal as they come, so it's important to return the favor every now and then when we get the chance, like the toddler you're about to see. Buddy here? One for him. him. One for him. Forget this him. guy's got to have one of those. Oh. <laughs> um, I like how the, puppy, uh, how the puppy downs that. All right. Again, one shot each. Uh, that's why those two are going to be besties I forever. Very sweet. That's it for today. Thank you for joining us on The Boost, and we will be back tomorrow with more of your favorite feel good stories. We'll see you right here on The Boost on Today All Day. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, Everybody is today. today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stuff with us now. <laughs> the boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about only on today. Hello, welcome to Health and Wellness Today. I'm Craig Melvin. For the next half hour, we are going to share some really empowering conversations about the importance of mental health. Plus, we're going to tell you everything you need to know to stay safe this summer. That's all coming up. So let's get to it. First up, a fresh look at the use of hormone therapy as a treatment for menopause and why some women are so hesitant. NBC's Maria Shriver has our story. As a treatment for menopause, the data on hormone therapy is unequivocal. Researchers call estrogen and progestin a first-line therapy for common and debilitating symptoms like hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, and pain during sex. Hormones reduce a woman's risk of osteoporosis, urinary tract infections, and type 2 diabetes. And top medical organizations say for most women under 60, the benefits of hormones outweigh the risks. Still surveys show more than half of menopausal women won't use hormone therapy. Scared off, say advocates, by an NIH-funded study called the Women's Health Initiative, or WHI, from two decades ago that they say dramatically overstated the risk of hormones. That study really misrepresented some of the facts. Dr. Sharon Malone is a veteran OBGYN and chief medical advisor for Alloy Women's Health, a leading menopause health care company. She says the WHI study, launched in the early 90s, looked at hormone therapy in postmenopausal women over 60. In 2002, researchers abruptly halted the study, citing evidence that older women who took hormones had a slightly raised risk of serious diseases. But the message to the public was far more alarming. Take this 2002 segment with a WHI researcher on the Today Show. You actually found heart disease, the risk increased by 29%. The risk of strokes increased by 41%. Invasive breast cancer risk increased by 26%. So what are we telling women, the 6 million women in America today who are taking Right. HRT. And not only the six million, but all those women who every day as they reach menopause have to make a choice of what they're going to do. It was horrible. There were headlines in the New York Times about the horrors of hormone replacement therapy. Patients came in and they felt betrayed. It can be a dangerous spot. But Dr. Malone says those risks were vastly overblown and didn't apply at all to women under 60 who were still in menopause. All of the things that they said, the breast cancer, the stroke, none of those things applied to younger women. It only applied to women who were older. What should NIH do to correct the record? What NIH should do is hold another press conference if need be. The most common reason why women avoid hormone replacement therapy, it is the fear of breast cancer. So we went to the NIH for answers. In some women with Dr. Janine Austin Clayton is director of their Office of Research on Women's Health. 
the change that women today want is they say, look at 20 years ago, NIH left us thinking that hormones were bad. NIH should bring us up to date on the new evidence about hormone therapy. Is there, that going to happen? There's a lot of new evidence. Discussions like we're having are the right way for us to get to as many women as possible. All the women who were on hormones at that time were taken off. It left women thinking that if they took hormones, they'd get breast cancer, heart disease, or all of the above. And that's wrong. So it answered a question that was designed to answer but it did leave other questions unanswered. I understand that led to fears about menopausal hormone therapy. We now know for women close to the menopausal transition that hormone therapy can be safe and effective for relieving menopausal symptoms. The benefits can outweigh the risks. She says the NIH never meant to mislead women about hormone safety, but go to their website on hormone therapy and you'll still find a list of studies focused on the health risks not the benefits. Does this need to be updated though, you think? Happy to review that and see if there's new information that needs to be added. We want women to have information that's current to make their treatment decisions. Now to a, to a truly incredible conversation with music superstar Demi Lovato. She opened up to Savannah Sellers about her own mental health journey and the importance of asking for help. I found something that I deal with now is anxiety. I've dealt with depression, I've dealt with addiction, I kind of have a checklist and I've just kind of knocked them all off. Global superstar Demi Lovato does not shy away from sharing her darkest moments. There have been times where I've dealt with depression where I have had suicidal ideations and it's something that I've struggled with since I was very young and it's something that I can still struggle with if I don't stay on top of it. Lovato made headlines in July 2018 when a drug overdose nearly took her life. She shared the previously unknown details in a YouTube documentary, revealing just how close to death she came. I had three strokes. I had a heart attack. Was that a hard decision to make, to be that open? It wasn't a hard decision for me because I've always been an open book. The very first time that I went to treatment was when I was 18 and I went for my eating disorder and I went for self-harm and emotional issues. And I, when I came out of that experience, I was faced with the decision of either keep your mouth shut and not say anything or share your experience, strength and hope with another person in hopes that it affects them in a positive way. And I decided to go with that route because I wanted to help others. I wish that I had had somebody when I was 13 years old. I wanted somebody in the public eye to say that, hey, this is what I've gone through and you don't have to choose that route. What do you want the 13 year old who's watching you now to know about if they're not okay? Talking to people and asking for help is more than okay and is absolutely what you should do. For Lovato, limiting her social media intake was key. It got to a point where I realized I can't read anything because if I read positive comments it feeds my ego and if I read negative comments it damages my ego and ultimately I don't want to navigate out of ego at all. What would it be like for you do you think if when you first started struggling you had the internet the way we do at our fingertips now and how damaging do you think it is? I think it's so damaging. I think that we live in a world of editing and Facetune and all these things that can change the way that we look. And it's hard to grow up in a world where that's right in front of your face and at your fingertips at all times. I grew up in a period of time where young Hollywood was very, very, very thin and that was the look. I think that had a really negative impact on my mental health, which I think fed into my eating disorder. Today, Lovato is focused on strengthening her mental health and pointing others to that path by being transparent and putting in the work. I don't want to paint the facade that everything is totally perfect yeah. and, and fine, but I am in a really good place and it has been kind of challenging to write a <laughs> happy rock album, <laughs> but I'm doing it. But I have bad days. I had a bad day on Sunday. I realized that even to this day, no matter how happy I might feel and seem, I'm human and it's okay to still struggle even when you're in a great place. Is this as important a part of your life as the other things that we know you for, being an advocate in this way? It's arguably even more important because music, 
Music, yes, it can last forever, but careers don't. Life and legacy is what's important, but the things that I'm most proud of are the fans that share their stories with me and say, you've saved my life. And that to me is more important than any award that I could win. Up next, we're going to introduce you to some small town doctors who are banding together for their patients. Plus, what you need to know to keep you and your family safe this summer. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Health and Wellness Today, with a closer look at some doctors who are facing mounting challenges and struggling to stay afloat in small town communities. Here's Kate Snow with their story. For Jennifer Bacani McKenney, Fredonia has always been home. As a kid, she rode her bike around the small rural Kansas town, spending time at the small practice her dad ran for 31 years. I saw that he was um, doing something special for people and connecting with people on a very personal level. Anything for you, Doc. Oh, I'm just going to keep you alive forever. 17 years after graduating from medical school, Dr. Jen, as some of her patients call her, is now running the family clinic and is one of the only doctors in town. I thought about just being able to take care of people who took care of me when I was growing up, and that was really kind of what made the difference in, in deciding where to go. Her patients, more like family, and her practice, a lifeline for many in her community. Dr. Jen has been multi-generational for my family. If you didn't have Dr. Jen, where would you go? I was seeing someone in Tulsa, so that would mean um, two hours. Two hour drive? Yes. For many private doctors across the country, that close personal bond with patients is what keeps their practice going. Dr. Naraj Sharma is a pain doctor in a small suburb in New York's Hudson Valley, north of New York City. Any pain, you let me know. She was just about the kids, the wife, everything. She knows yeah. about your family. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like you're just a number going in and out. Sharma sees anywhere from 10 to 20 patients a day, but the financial burden of running her own business is taking a toll. I'm HR, I'm the office manager, I'm the administrator, and I'm the doctor. And some insurance companies are paying her less. You're not what people maybe think of when they think of a doctor driving a fancy car, making a lot of money. Yeah, that's definitely not me. <laughs> there are some injections I perform and we get $54. You spend more on a mani-pedi than you do to see a double board certified interventional pain management doctor. How do you make ends meet? I don't take vacations. <laughs> I'm the only doctor here because if I had to pay another provider, I might as well close shop. Nationwide, the number of doctors who work in private practice is on the decline, now around 49 percent, down from 54 percent in 2018. And according to a recent analysis, nearly 70 percent of all doctors are either employed by a hospital or a corporation. 
experts point to an uneven playing field. Compared to a big medical group, small practices have little to no bargaining power with insurance companies. Private doctors often make a fraction of the salary for the same kind of work at a hospital. But Sharma thinks joining a larger network could compromise patient care. When you find a good doctor, it is. It's kind of emotional because <laughs> you, you place your trust in them. I love my patients. I feel that when they leave here, they're happier than when they entered my office. And if I can do that, hey, I think I'm doing a great job. Back in Kansas, Dr. Jen McKenney is pushing for more visibility. She's banded together with other private doctors in the area, sharing resources and bargaining with insurance providers as a group. McKenney also works at the University of Kansas, teaching and recruiting students into rural medicine, a job she says is incredibly rewarding. You know, I, I have a long road ahead in Fredonia and yeah, no plans to go anywhere soon. Coming up, we are going to answer your questions about summer safety. And then later, how a man is helping people find peace and joy with some simple tips that we can all learn from. That's right after this. Welcome back. Summer is here, but before you run out into the sun, there are some important safety tips to consider. NBC News contributor Dr. Natalie Azar recently answered some, some common questions from you about summer safety. <laughs> All right, so we got these for our first question comes from a viewer of ours. This is Lauren in Georgia, and, and uh, this is something we're going to hear about more as we get into the warm weather. Georgia! are every summer my kids and I always seem to get heat rash what is the best course of treatment and how do we prevent the heat rash to begin with so, so Natalie before we what is heat rash well heat rash it's also called prickly heat have uh -huh. you ever heard of this yeah. right so it's when you get these little tiny raised bumps on the background of kind of irritated skin it's a very very normal thing that can happen um, we do have tips for treatment and prevention we're gonna so think of it this way in terms of preventing Heat rash. Heat is in the name. So you want to do things that are going to keep you cool. So what does that mean? We're talking about staying in an air conditioned, cool environment, mm -hmm. drinking plenty of water, wear, you know, loose layers, not excess amounts of clothing. You want to avoid too much physical exertion and take cool showers or baths. And it follows that the treatment tips are very similar to sometimes the rash can be itchy. So you can use antihistamines either topically or take them by mouth. You can also take a cool bath or shower 
shower. You also want to avoid excess sweating and humid air. You can use oatmeal <gasps> and you can do this yourself. You can you can make a paste or you can put it in a bathtub and uh -huh. soak. And then of course you want to see your doctor if you think it might be coming infected, if you're scratching, especially little ones, uh -huh. draining, redness, increased pain. So use that overnight oats and just get right back in there. <laughs> I've got a twofer. <laughs> right back in there. Uh, this next question comes from Emily right here in New York City. Hi, Dr. Azar. I love working out, but now that it's getting hotter every day, I was wondering what are some ways to make sure we are staying properly hydrated? Oh. Such an important yeah. question, yeah. right? Right, Emily? So I think the biggest thing to remember is that if you start to drink when you're thirsty, it's too late. Mm. I remember uh, taking a hot yoga class, the yoga teacher saying, you need to hydrate before you get here, right? So the way to do this is you wake up in the morning, and by the way, this is if you're doing a lot of outdoor yeah. activities, right? As soon as you get up in the morning, you want to start drinking water. Again, if you wait until you're thirsty, it could be a little bit too late. You want to drink roughly about eight ounces every 15 to 20 minutes, but this is important. You don't want to go over 48 ounces in an hour. That's about a quart and a half because too much of water mm -hmm. can also not be such a good thing. You want to avoid alcohol, but a lot of people have a misconception that caffeine is dehydrating. It's not. If you're drinking oh. a coffee, you're drinking a soda, that also gives you water. And then have you heard of the urine cold Oh, yeah. Test, right? I'm big fans of that. You know, I a, have not. A well hydrated body mm -hmm. will make a very light clear or very light yellow pee. Yeah. But if it's dark orange, dark yellow, that could be a sign Some of dehydration. That's a quick and dirty litmus mm. test. Okay. All right, this next one is from our very own researcher. Hey, Nick. <laughs> hey, Dr. Azar. So with summer around the corner, I'm looking forward to getting outside more, going on some hikes, but what should I keep in mind to keep myself safe from ticks? <laughs> All right, This Nick. is a whole thing, right? It's a big tick season. It is absolutely it? is a big tick season. Remember that ticks love tall grassy areas. So if you're walking on a trail, make sure you're walking in the center of it. Always use EPA registered repellent. Perform daily tick checks on yourself and on your loved ones because they can hide out in sneaky places. You want to know how to remove a tick quickly, correctly, and you want to prevent your ticks on pets. Right? You want to talk yeah. to their vets and make sure they wear their collars and everything because they can bring it inside also. Uh -huh. Still to come, meet the man who started a mindfulness movement to help people live better lives. Plus, a former NFL player on a mission to make sure everyone has access to mental health care. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Taking care of our mental health is just as important as taking care of our physical health, but not everyone has access to those resources. Podcast host Case Kinney is doing something to change that. He talked to Chanel Jones about how he's helping others lead more intentional lives. For 35-year-old Chicago native Case Kinney, the key to mastering mindfulness is to talk about everything. So how does one become a mindfulness author? It was just kind of one of those points in life where I was like, it would be really unfortunate if I were to look back and 
10, 20, 30 years and realized that I was doing things, dating people, working a career that really wasn't true to me in a sense. So Kay started the New Mindset Who Dis podcast in 2018, a place where he could challenge himself to work out his day-to-day -day problems. I realized what I was doing, which was I was practicing mindfulness. It, you know, kind of intimidated me, but it's basically just the art of being present and being judgment-free to yourself so that you could find clarity in some form. As he kept posting, Case's listeners grew, and with the podcast now totaling over 30 million downloads, Case has since used his platform to challenge others to talk it out and put their own mental health at the top of the list. I love the focus on mental health, conversations around mental health, it has are having in culture and I like seeing more men come around to it so I'm excited a couple years from now just to see how many people are practicing their own form of mindfulness. So the fact that it was so successful did you expect that? The fact that it resonated with so many people and continues to resonate with so many people really surprised me but I think it speaks to the the larger need in culture and society that I think a lot of people really want to do these things they just don't necessarily know how to get started and they need a, a relatable first step. Wanting to provide folks with that first step, Case created guided journals with titles like Unbother, But First Inner Peace, and even Single is Your Superpower. Journaling is so powerful because it's bringing a thought from your mind into your hand, into a pen on paper. Your latest book is called That's Bold of You, about letting go of what you're not. It came from a lot of the feedback from people who listen to my podcast, who have said basically something to the extent of, I feel like I'm too much or I'm too difficult. So I call it the book that's bold of you because it's a bold thing to push back on the labels that have been given to us. A few years ago, he also started posting his words of wisdom on Instagram. I've kind of become known as, as the quote guy. So I've just realized that there's power in writing these silly little quotes, putting them up around Chicago or Miami or New York, and just reminding people of these things that we intuitively know, but maybe hearing it in a different way, maybe hearing it said in a slightly different version. That's what makes it click. And they've clicked with more than 480,000 followers, including the likes of Lucy Hale, Haley Bieber, and Viola Davis. I'm also impressed with like how creative you are. I'm like, oh, a coffee cup. That's a good place for yeah. a quote, like just right there. So I was like, what are things that we touch and feel? So I started writing on coffee cups. And then I was like, well, yeah, I've got more to say. So I need a little <laughs> more surface area. So I started doing paper. But for Case, the biggest reward is making a difference in the lives of others. People have said that my words changed their life or helped them get out of an unhealthy relationship or find their soulmate or just be happier, uh, which of course I can't take credit for. You know, they're the ones doing it. But hearing things like that is just so powerful. And I think that is just an amazing thing to witness. And just like Case, former NFL player Ryan Mundy is also shining a light on mental health. I recently sat down with him to talk about his own journey and his new mental health platform, Alchemy. I accomplished my dream in my hometown and won a Super Bowl there, right? And I've made money and I have insurance and I have all these things at my disposal and I'm still not okay. Ryan Mundy, an eight-year NFL veteran, knows a little something about playing with heart. What he did not know was how to deal with all that was happening inside his head. How did you get into football? I started playing football at the age of seven. After making All-American at his Pittsburgh high school, Ryan played four seasons at the University of Michigan, then one season at West Virginia before the NFL came calling in 2008. It's quite rare for someone to get drafted by their hometown team. It was quite surreal. I used to go to Three River Stadium and take donations for my Pop Warner football team. And I would see the players pulling up in their fancy cars. And I was like, one day that's gonna be me. Ryan became a Super Bowl champion with the Steelers in 2009, going on to play six more seasons in the game, including one with the New York Giants and two as a Chicago Bear. Being a professional athlete, we all know the, the discipline that it takes. Yeah. And then of course there's a, the physical aspect of it as well. There's also a mental aspect. Yep. What kind of toll did playing take on, on that part of, of Ryan Monday? I developed a really high tolerance for pain and being in uncomfortable situations. And that's great, but then you have to acknowledge, hey, like I'm not okay, or I'm not feeling like myself. And in that sport, hyper-masculinity, sometimes that's a difficult conversation to have. I've heard that oftentimes NFL players face a bit of a, an identity crisis when they decide to hang up the cleats. What was your experience? 
very much the same, but the NFL offers these executive education programs that I was taking advantage of. I even got an MBA at the University of Miami, Florida, all while I was an active athlete. I was dealing with anxiety. I was dealing with depression. I was dealing with identity issues and smiling on the outside, but struggling on the inside. And also during this time, my family was going through a list of chronic conditions. And so I reflected back on like my exposure in the venture capital space where a lot of money flows to solve big problems. And I didn't see any money flowing to solve my problem or the problem that my family was going through. In October 2020, Ryan launched Alchemy, a mental health platform designed to meet the needs of the black community. Why is there such a glaring void in the mental health care space for the black community? Finding culturally intelligent care, folks who can understand your experience, really challenging proposition, less than 4% of psychologists are black, less than 2% of psychiatrists are black, but then also mental health and wellness support is very expensive. Alchemy aims to even out the playing field of mental health practices, offering content from meditations to courses on relationships and more from clinical experts that look like him. I think we have gotten to a point where we talk about the need for therapy. And the reality is, a lot of people who need to do that, they don't have insurance or they don't have a job. First of all, where they can leave for an hour in the middle of the day yeah. or they can afford it on a regular basis. Therapy is a luxury. But how do you fix that? We think about innovative approaches like, okay, well, what are we calling therapy? Things can be therapeutic that aren't necessarily therapy. Changing deep-rooted ideas about mental health may be harder than playing pro football, but Ryan is hopeful. You've got two kids, I've got two kids. One of the things that I, I always worry about is they seem fine on, yeah. on the outside, but I don't know yeah. what's going on in here. How do you make sure that your kids are mentally healthy? Yeah, talking to them. They didn't have an opportunity to see me as an active NFL athlete, uh, but now again, they have a front row seat to what it looks like to be a black entrepreneur in America, right? And so like, particularly, I gotta walk the walk. And so like, I meditate with my kids. I talk openly with, about my kids. Uh, we make sure that they have the things that they need for them to be the best and highest version of themselves. That's gonna wrap up another episode of Health and Wellness Today. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time, right here on Today All Day. Over the years, I have been lucky enough to step into the Today Show kitchen and watch the best chefs from around the world teach us some incredible recipes. We had made that pesto, which was, oh, exactly. darn. Oh, you know, I almost got out of this one That's clean. Cool. Turn it down. <laughs> oh, my God. I had one job. None of which I mastered because I didn't know the first thing about how to cook. But those days are behind me for good, and I'm finding some confidence in the kitchen. Now, my friend and all-around superstar, Drew Barrymore, and her chef, BFF, Pilar Valdez, are gonna teach me a few weeknight favorites. We're gonna be making a watermelon salad with pistachio duca and shrimp scampi with bucatini, both from their cookbook, Rebel Homemaker. I am so excited to be cooking with these ladies today, so let's get started. Drew and Pilar, I need to know everything you know. Well, I know that I love you. I know that wow. I love you. She really does, and we're so excited to be here. What's the plan, Pilar? So today's plan, we're gonna cut the watermelon, pickle the rind, prepare the duca, assemble the salad, cook the shrimp and pasta, make the pan sauce, plate, and serve. So first up yeah. for our watermelon salad, we're gonna break down the watermelons. I do love a good piercing, but now of course I'm stuck. Oh, this is good. Wow, this Boom. Is... Savannah, you're doing great over there. Oh. It's not Don't a competition. Bad. Look at the difference between our two heads. <laughs> Look at your melons. Oh my gosh. And put the other half That's what I was aside. thinking. Why are we so juvenile? <laughs> When that's we why we're such 14. good friends. I know. Okay. I see how this episode yes. is gonna oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna lob off the top of it. We're gonna just take off the dark green. Mine doesn't look anything like yours. So it does, what Pilar. happened with yours, Drew, is that you didn't. Um, you took off. You were overachieving. You took off the skin and the rind. Um, but our first step was just to do uh, the skin. So Savannah, you can continue on what you were doing and okay. now we're just taking off the rind. So exactly okay. the same kind of oh, okay. sawing and shaving motion downwards. Okay. And now are we keeping it off. this rind? We are, because that's what we're gonna pickle, oh. actually. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna take your watermelon and you could cube this, but for this salad, mm -hmm. I actually like to cut it in irregular shapes. I feel good about this part. Yeah, that looks really good. Yeah, it does. So you're gonna take your 
Ryan, Ryan basically. Yes. And we're going to uh, dice it. Okay. You're gonna flip it over so it has, yeah. Mm -hmm. Savannah, I can see the claw coming out, which is really good. I'm trying to learn. You wanna tuck in those I like digits. to cut like this. I do too, <laughs> I'm like, I like to lop off And this would Thickness. be a dicing, this not is a, a dice. mince. Nope, because What's it's pretty What's the difference chunky. between dicing and mincing? Size. So the, absolutely, size, <laughs> size matters. <laughs> I'm gonna take a sip on that. What are we drinking? This is so good, by the it way. Is so what good. is it? It's a mocktail, it's a version of a Pimm's, it's based on a Pimm's cup, which is usually with gin, but this oh, one is without. Way, you would <laughs> never know there was an alcohol in oh here. Oh my gosh. Drew what loves, is that? Very gingery, right? Yeah, so there's ginger beer, and Drew, I know you love tea, so it's a combination of black and rooibos. Okay, that's a very unique flavor. Yep. <laughs> it's okay. so good. All right, so wait, what do right. we do now? Pickling anything is a flavor profile that I really love. Oh, me too. It is basically uh, equal parts water and apple cider okay. vinegar. So, Savannah, so three quarters cup that. water. Mm -hmm. Three fourths cup water, three fourths cup apple cider vinegar. Got it. Mm -hmm. And then one you can actually, um, and then one, mm -hmm. exactly. Ooh, I like the honey equal bear. parts um, a lot. Yeah. It's just such an easy brain yeah. yes. ratio to remember. Yeah. yeah. Let's add in uh, the salt. What, are you sprinkling it on purpose? Uh -huh. or are you just trying? <laughs> no, I am because I don't like the dump. Is yeah. like then you have to work harder to get the solubility. If you shake it in, I feel like it's just a better. That's method. actually a very good pro tip. And right. then Drew, I'm gonna have you add in the fennel seed, which is half on top. Half teaspoon. Half seed, teaspoon of fennel please, seed. Honey, lovely. Sprinkle on in. <laughs> uh, you got crazy. I usually half teaspoon uh, coriander. There you go. I'm and we're gonna do half a teaspoon of the cumin. Oh. And then the last thing is half a teaspoon of the pink peppercorn. I love pink peppercorn and I especially love it on green dishes. Yeah. Oh, Savannah, okay. have you had pink peppercorn? No, I before? have not. So they're really, and you can actually take a little and take a little bite and they're like very fruity and floral. Oh, yeah, but they're peppery. not super, a little peppery, but not as pungent as a yeah. boss. It's gonna basically come up to a little bit of a simmer. Okay. And as long as the honey and the salt is completely dissolved, then you can pull it off. Drew, you're gonna carefully pour it into our one cup okay, of she water. Too well. Well. She's like, you know that graceful <laughs> ginger side of yourself yes. that, that you don't have to try to tap that to it. just pouring it right over. Yep. Then what happens? After 30 minutes, this is going to be good to go. It's like so easy. Super easy. That's pickling. That's pickling. pickling. Boom. Boom. on to the pistachio dukkha component of our salad. Okay. Dukkha is an Egyptian condiment. It's usually a blend of like nuts and seeds and spices. You okay. should have some coriander, coriander. seed. Mm -hmm. Two, teaspoons Two teaspoons of coriander seed. Okay. Is this, is this the cumin? That's cumin. Okay, mm -hmm. Ooh, Absolutely. going off, oh. going rogue. Okay, then it's She's one, rogue. One no, quarter so cup sesame hold, seeds. Hold on the sesame oh. seeds, actually, Savannah, so you're gonna toast that Can we first. turn it up? How high should it be? Um, let's do medium. Okay, Okay, and it's an empty plate, there's no oil or anything? No, absolutely okay. not. You want it in a dry skillet. They have skillet. oils on them, right? Yes, they do, so they're starting to release it, and you just have to shake it occasionally, not okay. constantly. Okay. Um, and 
you're gonna notice a change in color. They're gonna start to get a little darker, but really what you're looking for, Savannah, is the smell. Okay. It's gonna start to like release this like toasty smell. You're gonna smell the coriander. It's gonna mm -hmm. be very floral. It's starting. Can you smell yeah. it? Yeah. Let's give that a shake, actually. Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah. I can. Ooh, I like it. And yes. on the average, would you say about two minutes, color? About two minutes, okay. yeah. Take it off, because okay. I can see a okay. little bit of heat. Let's okay. turn oh, yeah. off the Don't pan. Just, okay. Yeah. Now what? Um, and you're gonna divide, actually, the spices between your and Drew's mortar and pestle. Habsy, habsy. What I like to do when I have spices is that instead of go in and like bash immediately, I kind of like to muddle, so a circular motion, and that helps it break down. Because okay. if you go in and you're bashing, yeah. it's gonna like firework spices Okay, so I'm everywhere. like just kind of stirring. So, yep. Can I start smashing yes, now? Yes, I think so. And you can apply a little more pressure to Savannah. Am I trying to get this to like a very fine grain? Pretty, pretty fine. So with the duca, we want a little bit of a mm. play on texture, so you'll have fully ground pieces and then some pieces that are just more broken up. So I'm happy mm -hmm. with where mine is at. How so do you like mine? What do you think? Beautiful. Oh, Lovely. Okay, that's good. 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 Yeah. That's and nice. I think you, you guys can both pop uh, your spices, Savannah and Drew, into that bowl. Okay. Into one bowl. Into one okay. bowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yours is nicer. I and think. that's really nice because then you guys have a, a uh, texture. Yeah. Yes. Play on I texture. I went hard, you went soft. Uh, well. So now we're going to toast the sesame seed. Okay, we need one quarter cup sesame seed. So mm -hmm. just let it go in there. Unlike, yeah, you can shake it a little. You can use the spatula. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sesame seeds, as soon as they start to change color, you want to take them off the heat. So keep stirring that, Savannah. They're going to go golden really, really quickly. I can okay. smell them, so I think we're almost there. Okay. And you definitely don't want to burn them. No. Burning bad. Yeah. Okay. Burning bad. <laughs> While Savannah is uh, toasting the sesame seeds, Drew, I'm going to have you add in um, our salt. Our That's flaky a, sea salt. Is this a maldon? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's a One. tablespoon into that bowl where your spices are. I love a maldon. I do too. It's so different I than other salts. I put it on salts. top of my chocolate chip cookies. Yes. yes. Nice. Look at you. <laughs> I didn't know. I have a little baking skill. And then Drew, you're going to do, um, those are hemp hearts or hemp seeds. Two tablespoons. And hemp seeds. Savannah. Yes, they're really great forms of protein and fiber and vitamins, actually. And again, it's like we're playing a lot with textures. Yeah. So that's a really lovely addition. Your favorite, Drew, half a teaspoon. I would say, Savannah, maybe 30 more seconds on that, and then we're going to be good. Mm -hmm. um, a pink peppercorn okay. and just a smidge, a smidge, smidge, smidge of black pepper. Okay. Smidge. That's more there, than that's a smidge. Plenty. That's definitely more than a smidge. Wow, you have a hot. <laughs> I love <laughs> spicy <laughs> time. Everything okay. could be coated and rubbed in pepper. All right, do you think we're I good on these seeds? Let me see. I feel like they're mm. almost there, okay. right? They're almost turning golden. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we need music. All right, okay. I think that looks really good, Savannah. Okay. So let's uh, turn off the heat. Mm -hmm. Dump them yep. in. Dump them in. And now we have the pistachios. I can just kind of like Absolutely. do this like Savannah, Julia Child like stuff. Too. That's great. You're kind of rocking back and forth. Am I making you proud, Pilar? You are making me so proud. This second. <laughs> I'm actually going to stop you guys right there because I really like the two textures that we're playing with. Okay. Savannah's on like a finer and then Drew's is on a rough. So I think we're we've established This a is a really good combo. <laughs> we're going to scoop all those nuts into this bowl. Scooping the nuts. Yeah. Pretty colors, too. Really, really pretty, yeah. And Drew, you're gonna give it a good mix. No pistachio left behind. There. No pistachio mm -hmm. left behind, please. Okay, that looks amazing. Yeah, and I'm busting out something here that I was told. It's a gold box Savannah's tasting spoons. Do you have special spoons? They're just special, because you're supposed to taste your food. Did you know that? I didn't, and now I do. So just take a little. Take a little, and and then we can sort of play from there. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be, it's gonna have that floral from. I yes. like it. I wouldn't yes. change one thing, would you? It's it has perfect. enough salt, enough pepper. It, it really, really does. does. <laughs> All right, success, ladies. The love story continues. <laughs> we made duka. We're gonna assemble the salad, but when we're plating it, it's gonna be a little bit of a friendly competition. Ooh. And then. <laughs> Let's go. You guys got this. <laughs> All right, okay. so in your little jar um, is a simple lemon vinaigrette. Okay. It's just lemon, 
olive oil, salt, and pepper. Okay. And it's separated a little, so just give them a little shake. Mm -hmm. It emulsifies it, which is there you ever go, so Drew. important. If anyone's doing an oil and vinegar salad, emulsify it first, it'll taste 50 times better. Okay. Wrap in your knowledge. All right, so in your bowl, you have a little bit of arugula. So I like to coat a little bit of the bowl. I know, it sounds crazy, right, Savannah? But You're I'm not going to use all of that. No, so. you don't have to, and you dress the taste. But when you coat the side of the bowl, you're basically not dumping it on the leaves. And then now we can start building. Okay. So a little arugula on the plate. Remember, oh. you're making something beautiful. Okay. okay. A arugula on the plate. This is where the competition comes. Yes. Okay, so and what's our next one? Your watermelon slices, you're going to dip it in the dukkha. Oh, dip it in the dukkha. And however you want to <laughs> dip it is up to you, and you're going to lay it yeah, on you, the plate. You duke you. you. <laughs> so there you go. So you're just dipping those watermelon slices. And oh, I like to leave a bit of it without the dukkha, just so that it has that freshness, and then you'll get the pop. Oh, so some dukkha and some don't. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I'm actually asking. I feel like they should be like late night comedy. I know. I know. Just <laughs> cheesy, like Rodney Dangerfield. By the way, the best. Okay. Here, there's no rules. Okay. Don't forget to finish also with your pickled watermelon rind. You can scatter it around. How can I win? What if I make like a tower? I know. You can by totally the way, make a I'm tower. Thinking of tower. Little the like time. Jenga. Okay. And then you can finish with a little bit of Maldon salt also, okay. which just like brings all those flavors together. I learned from A little Salt Bay Maldon salt. Oh, I love it. I don't know. Shall we oh, Vogue, <laughs> Vogue for the camera? Yes, that's what, I think we know who's his best. It's yours. <laughs> this looks very pretty. Really? It, it really does. I like I your little tower. I feel like they're both they're both pretty. They, I also feel like these are three extremely different, different approaches. <laughs> yeah. You went like just put it on the plate. No, actually, I feel like yours has like a um, a, a, a Lines, strategic right? pattern. Yeah, no, it does. And yours is sort of abundant, <laughs> and mine is a mouth. I love it. All, All right, right. Shall cheers. We, shall we walk? Yeah. Let, oh, cheers, let's guys. Yeah. doing one of Drew's favorite recipes. Scampi. 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 Who's I... gonna devein and have their way with those shrimp? Well, they actually are already peeled and deveined, although Drew is killer deveining them. <laughs> All right, but we've got the water boiling. We've got the water boiling. Did, did we salt it like the sea? I love that. Say it again, Savannah. I salt it like the sea. Thank you. Okay. So, Drew, what I'm going to have you do actually is season the shrimp. So, that's actually baking soda. Mm. And so, we're going to do just a quarter teaspoon, Drew, and you're going to sprinkle it all over the shrimp. And the reason why we do baking soda 
mm -hmm. I love it, is that it basically helps no the shrimp brown and get this really beautiful color. Oh, okay. And then we're going to do salt and pepper mm -hmm. on your shrimp. I feel like you should be doing this. <laughs> yeah. I've seasoned it with salt and then we'll uh, give good. it a good toss. I love okay. a little flour, a Look little it, I egg wash. I'm there shimmying you go. my salt. No not dumping over here. <laughs> no, no, not anymore. I'll never dump okay. again. So we're going to let the shrimp that has salt and pepper and baking soda sit for about like five or ten minutes. And meanwhile, we are going to attack our garlic. Okay. Um, so today we're going to slice the garlic fine. We don't want to crush it because that's just going to burn in our sauce. Mm. So what I like to do is just take the tip off. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of brown. On this. And you're gonna spin it, we're gonna cut it lengthwise. Okay. Fast. You have some olive oil. We're gonna do three tablespoons. Happy to eyeball it. There's also a measure if you'd like, but. Well, the, like, I've been encouraged to eyeball, I so I'm gonna try. Eyeball. I think this is one tablespoon. I think that's good. Two. Yeah. Three. Beautiful. Do you agree? Yeah. Kind of, sorta? That's really, really great. And then you're just gonna. Rock it. Our baby's all grossed up. <laughs> She's eyeballed. Oh, no. yeah. I eyeballed. Okay. Okay. And what you're gonna do, Savannah, is add the garlic. Mm -hmm. Put it right in there. Yeah. You don't want too high of a heat yeah. and to end up like me who burns their garlic. And okay. Drew, you're gonna add the red pepper flakes. Okay. <clears throat> and having enough oil helps you not burn the garlic. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many? Half a teaspoon, so just that measure. And if you want things spicier, you can go more. You, you know, know she again. does. Miss spicy she, she likes. It's gonna start to change color. It's gonna go kind of translucent, translucent. and sticky. I, I have feel it like in. You can start pulling. Okay. Um, you do this. So we were just whoo, um, infusing the olive oil mm, basically with that garlic and pepper okay. uh, flavor. Okay. Okay. So what? Throw this in. You're gonna throw it in, and then you're gonna give it a good stir. And we're using bucatini, um, which is basically like a, a thicker spaghetti with a hole in it. Okay. Um, but you could use any sort of long shape of pasta, and you're gonna cook that pasta until just all dented okay. because we're gonna finish it off in the sauce. Okay. Um, do but sauce. you're gonna lay the shrimp down in a single single layer, okay. and you're not going to stir it, you're going to shake it, you know, lay occasionally, it lay it down, yeah. Actually, will you hold, Savannah? You don't think it's hot enough? Yeah, so. Stand back. How are you, what are you looking at here. to know if it's so hot enough? So you want a, a little bit of ripple, you do not want smoke. We're not okay. like, trying no. to, and no bubble. <laughs> Wait, let me. You want this. that sizzle and you're not getting Oh yeah, it. I'm definitely wanting, I can see it a little bit here. Let me, can I borrow that? There you go. Here you go. There oh. you go. There you go. Oh. So let's start. Yeah, Here interesting. You go. I stepped away. Everything started <laughs> functioning. Meanwhile, my arm is going to fall off. Um, holding these. Oh, oh yeah. Shrimp. That. You know what? I hear what you're talking about yeah. now, Pilar. Yeah. There's a decade. That's says why off. she wanted to hear this. No wonder. Yeah. All right. People always talk about talk about cooking. You know, like smell and what you can see. Mm. I'm always like. I'm like, I can hear my water boiling. I can hear it sizzling. Oh, like, I like that. She brought in the it. strongest sense of them all. <laughs> exactly. The color will start to tell you when pink. it's good. It starts to get pink. Its and tails are already pink. Yep. Do it's, I need to flip them over ever? Not You know yet. what, let's, I think it's a little too early, but you, let's peek at one and basically the color will have changed and it's gonna have a little bit of like kind of, sp ooh, okay. That was so good to me. A little more. Okay. And you can give the pan a little bit of a light shake but we're not. You we're, don't mess with them. Don't not them. Yeah. So Savannah, when you flip them, you're gonna kind of move them to a different. Okay. Uh, They're gonna go in different, different spot. There moving you go. Different neighborhood. Yeah. Because it does. You know, some stuff will have heat zip code I know. I'm gonna have you add two tablespoons of that butter. So that's one, one two, two. Beautiful. Just into that pan. Uh, Ooh, now lovely. we're talking. The reason why we put just the two pats of butter right now is that you're basically starting to build that flavor. Right. You touch it with your finger right now. You see Pretty how firm. firm it is? Yes. Okay. Is that a good thing? That is a really good thing. Okay. So we're almost there. So we're just going to rescue the shrimp. Mm -hmm. Take them out? Take them out, leave the butter in and cook in. Okay. And oh, they're, they're basically like That's almost it. done. Mm -hmm. We're going to finish them off with the pasta and the sauce. Drew, will you actually, speaking of pasta, stir. I've forgotten. Um, please stir it. Test and it. then maybe just uh, try a new. No, very far. Nowhere All right. near. All right. Hard as a rock. <laughs> Al dente. Stiff right. as a board. This is like, can I, pencils? Sure. 
Uh, that's great, sir. No, that's, oh yeah. So in this little carafe here, mm -hmm. we have uh, white w wine. Wine, okay. Dump it in. Dump it in, and then you're gonna take your wooden Ooh. spoon. Deglaze? Deglaze. What is deglazing, Savannah? Scraping the nasty bits off the bottom. <laughs> the yummy yes, bits. The, I know, the flavor bits. Yes, absolutely. I did learn a deglazing. Um, I love that. All right, you're gonna do, um, not the all that butter, actually. You're gonna do four more tablespoons, basically. One, yeah. two. Oh, look yeah. at you eyeballing Three. it. Yeah, it's impressive. All right. right, and that goes into the pan. Look at Yeah. This is hey, right here. Duty. This is graduate school. <laughs> We're gonna dump in the cooked garlic, all that oil, and mm. the chili. We're gonna let this go. I want you guys to taste it. Where it is, there's Savannah's golden oh, the box. Golden spoon. But you so have there's one. no lemon yet. It tastes lemony to me now. Really? Oh, from the white wine, right? Oh. And that's gonna reduce and cook. Oh my! What God, do you think? It's incredible. <laughs> I'm actually just gonna come in. Mm -hmm. What's and this lemon juice? So it's two tablespoons of lemon. We're not gonna do all of it because I wanna do kind of to taste. Mm -hmm. So let's start there, okay. I think. What do you think over there? Or is that done? No, not done. Still not Although, done? Well, actually, I'd like Pilar to test this because. Happy to. Noodles keep cooking. Yeah, and, and we're gonna finish it off in the sauce as well. So this might something. actually be almost Pretty good. there. Mm -mm. Still one more minute. Yeah. Yeah. Almost there. Should I turn it down? So more? Yeah, let's turn it's that really down. going crazy yeah. here. And how's that here sounding now, Pilar? Yeah. <laughs> now we got That's it. That's the sound I want. I like to pick herbs too for like yeah. salads, but oh. for something like this, I'm like, no, that's totally fine. Okay. So you want to get it again. What'd like, you do? Did you cut down. off the stems? I put the stems underneath. So I cut oh. them, cut the stems. Mm -hmm. See, by the way, I'm oh. grabbing this like before this? Yes. I forget everybody. And then tuck them so under it. Oh. Basically. oh, she's saving her pasta water. <laughs> oh, I like your today show pasta theme. Pasta water. Okay, and then I put the stems under. So, yeah. So yes. I know it's uncomfortable, but yeah. just like you okay. can go slow and you're going to do a rough Because it's ready. Drew reports that the pasta is All ready. right. Okay. And Savannah, you're gonna start putting that pasta in. Mm -hmm. And it's Ooh. totally fine that it has the liquid because yeah, that's just gonna make a, a, a nicer emulsified sauce. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Look how beautiful that is. Oh my sauce gosh, this is, looks right? incredible. And I think you do need a little bit more pasta water, Drew. Would you oh, think? Just, aren't you just glad a you little, saved it, a Drew? Little bit, a touch. Give me a little splash. That's okay. great. Wow. Yeah. And is the shrimp just the very last thing I put on there? Yes. I like this big old skillet yeah. too. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Makes me feel like a real chef. Um, Savannah, you're gonna kill the heat. Okay. Done. And then you're gonna garnish with your chopped parsley. Right in the bowl, huh? Right in there. And I don't wanna go crazy, right? Just a little like that? Just a, just a little for color and then okay. you can give it a toss again. It's, the, the shrimp oh gosh, is it looks so good. perfect. <laughs> like wow. it's ridiculous. And Perfect. how are we gonna plate it? We got a bowl for you. Okay. Now, okay. This, part, this is gonna be a little tricky. Um, because this thing weighs six billion pounds. Oh, watch out! Watch out! Okay, look. I think we did pretty good. Cool. Oh, yes. I think we did perfect. Look at it. Wow, and then you. By the way, roll. I feel like you should lie in King that now. <laughs> the ball. Oh! <laughs> wow. And then you can serve it with a little bit more fresh parsley, chili okay. flake, lemon. Garnish. Love it. Garnish it up. Just a little bit. We, yeah. we chopped those. Let's go. Yeah. Guys, Shall we? let's chow down. Ah! Let's do it.
does this look? I mean, this is our garden party. It's so pretty. It is really, shall we? Yes. Okay. Please. My first Dooku. I've never had a Dooku before. Dooka. The Dooka. <laughs> exactly. It's so good. Mm. You really get those spices. You do. It's delish. In the back of the palate and through the nose. Mm. But mm. it's so cold and refreshing. Also, right? And then you have the pickle that comes through that is just like I a little it. floral. Listen, Ooh. I love that pickled rind. Yeah. I never knew I could feel that way about a watermelon rind. I'm really excited that you're saying me that. Me too. To this that is that. a whole new world for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you um, some people call it a nest. Um, I'm really going to focus on the pasta. If I catch a little shrimp in there, for you. I catch a little shrimp in there. So be it. What are we doing? We're going to make a little round ball? Well, you're supposed to make a pasta nest, but this is not working. And then oh. my tongs also won't go all the way to the... God darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, you know what will really help? Let what? me try this again. Let me get it with a fork. Okay. Because that... Um, like a fork I feel oh. like this is going to, yeah. yeah. There you go. It should work much nicer. Want to nest there you go. I want to nest you. Okay. Oh, that's so pretty. And then you just kind of dip the ladle. There you go. Oh my gosh. And fancy then you pants. can unfork it. And then a little bit of shrimp. You're so classy. <laughs> Here. Thank there. you. Yeah. <laughs> third All right, time. I need it. Third, third time's a charm. I believe in you, Drew. Okay. Let's so. see. I oh no, you're, you're nesting. Oh, there That's you your go. best nest yet. There you See? go. Third time's the charm. Oh, and that then, is beautiful. That's so pretty. Oh, there you go. I'm chowing down. I can't wait yes, anymore. Yes, yes. This is delicious. Mm -hmm. You guys cooked that shrimp like perfectly. The shrimp came out real good. Real right? money. Yeah. Perfect. I agree. Money shrimp. Proud of us. And that like little pop from the shrimp mm. too, that baking mm. soda like really affects the texture. So it feels like super fresh. It does. Ladies. I'm so proud of us. Can we raise a glass? To friendship. To friendship. To friendship. Cheers. Well, good morning. Welcome to The Boost. And we're going to start your day with a boost of good news. We're going to start with the family who left their lives behind in search of hope right here in the United States. And they say they found instant support from total strangers. Vicki Nguyen has more. Nguyen Nguyen and Ali Nguyen are paying a visit to Afghan refugees, Sahib Mashwani and his family of eight. They make lentils and garbanzo beans. They're delivering donated food. Sahib, his wife, and their six children have only been in Seattle for a few days, finally settling down after spending their first few months on a United States military base in Texas. The family shares tea and their deep thanks with Wien, Ali, and Tan Tan, volunteers with the group Viets for Afghans. When Wien saw this harrowing imagery of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan after 20 years of war, it triggered her own memories of her family's escape from Vietnam as boat people, a journey that took the lives of four family members, including her mother and two siblings. How did that experience at 10 years old shape who you are now? I would say that it made me realize that how someone's life can just turn upside down really, really quickly. I have a lot of empathy for, for one's uh, life situation when it can change uh, that fast. Flashing back to her struggles and the kindness of strangers who helped her resettle in the United States nearly 40 years ago, Nguyen didn't hesitate. Lentils. <laughs> I just picked up my phone and I texted my four other friends and just tell them that I think we need to do something. So you just picked up the phone and said, who's in? Exactly. <laughs> and so far we have sponsored two of those family here to Seattle and we're planning to do more. Viets for Afghans is about 15 volunteers strong. They use the Sponsor Circles program, a community initiative requiring at least five adults to agree to assist with housing, schooling, and jobs for refugees. We never thought of like on a Vietnamese family or immigrants in general being in positions where they can help other immigrants. Ali is one of Sahib's sponsors. She met the family picking them up at the airport, had furniture, even beds and toys for the kids donated. You see the evacuation from Afghanistan, and just as a human, you can't help but want to help. 
He's saying he's uh, really thankful. I can relate. In 1980, my family and I ended up in Eugene, Oregon, as refugees from Vietnam. Sponsors helped us transition to our new life. It is a kindness you can never repay. Kindness, like when Sahib learned he and his family will live in this apartment, Tam Win, offering it rent free. Let me show you where your house is going to be. Tam, also a refugee from Vietnam, arrived in Seattle in 1980. Today, he's a pharmacist, developer, restaurateur, and now a volunteer for Viets for Afghans. This is my second chance, and my chance is to help another family. It's a privilege. There are currently 18,000 Afghan refugees on military bases across the U.S. waiting to find permanent homes. Sahib says he worked as a special forces contractor, backed by the United States, and feels many more Afghans should be given refuge here. There are a lot of people in Afghanistan that sacrifice so much for the United States government. They're being killed, so he's calling upon anybody that can help to get them evacuated. <laughs> refugees helping refugees, paying their debt of kindness forward to a new generation of Americans. And now we've got another story for you, sure to make you smile. Take a look. This is my first day seeing this. And when you saw your name on the Broadway marquee, it's gotta be insane. It's bananas. Stand-up comedian Alex Edelman has performed his one-man comedy show all over the world. I have an uncle who doesn't like gay people, and because of that, I have come out of the closet on Thanksgiving every Thanksgiving. In his solo show, Just For Us, the jokes are about his Jewish identity. My full name is David Yosef Shimon Ben Eluzer Ruvain Alexander Halevi Edelman. An act he's performed and perfected, but took off after rave reviews and sold out off-Broadway runs. Let's go in. So, so yeah, let's get inside. Now the 34-year-old comedian is making his Broadway debut. When you look at this, even a little nervous? <laughs> of course I'm nervous, it's Broadway. Like this all happened because of word of mouth. Like I'm not famous. <laughs> like I'm aggressively not famous. Just for us, the show, it centers around you, a young Jewish man, decided to show up at a meeting of white nationalists, yeah. white supremacists. Why? Um, I was unemployed. No, I was on Twitter. I was actually really curious about this sort of like look into window of like anti-Semitic Twitter. One of them tweeted, hey, if you have questions about your whiteness, come to this address at this time. And I thought it was gonna be, you know, intense, polite conversation over scones or something on whiteness. And I got there and it was not that. But come on, man, it's a little crazy. I was a little nervous. Did you go into it terrified? I mean, I'm a stand-up comedian. Yeah. So like, I walk into rooms every night where people hate me. Yeah. Like, that's it. Uh... Audiences of all kinds may have found the show, but it also came at a moment when there was an undeniable rise of anti-Semitism. People were like, God, your show's so timely. And I was like, yeah, if you want to write a show that's evergreen, write about how like ice cream is, is great and anti-Semitism is a problem. Alex says the show's also resonated with diverse non-Jewish audiences. Someone from an Indian family came up to me crying. A lot of people, the show is about assimilation. The parts of ourselves that we sort of put into our pockets to fit in in any room. He said, you can't have that, David, we're Jewish. Alex grew up in a modern Orthodox Jewish home in Brookline, a suburb of Boston. He includes in the show his family's kosher Christmas to help a Christian friend not have to celebrate alone. It's a story about empathy and the understanding that we show our neighbors and are shown by our neighbors. My mother's from Ohio, so I think it afforded her the opportunity to like finally have the Christmas she'd always wanted. My mom put up stockings above the fireplace with our names on them in Hebrew. So how did you go from a Jewish day school to Broadway? Comedy clubs, man. Comedy clubs are the are the best. I started comedy as like a in my late teens. I didn't get serious about it until I was out of college. Legendary comedians that have come to see it yeah. and say such amazing things about it. It's crazy, dude. Comedy legends like Jerry Seinfeld, Billy Crystal, and Steve Martin. And every comic who comes, I ask them for something. Give me some criticism. And Steve Martin's like, I don't have criticism, but I have a line. Do you want a line? He gave you a line. He gave me a line. So the show is co-written by Steve Martin. Billy Crystal told you to stop using a hand mic. Yes. Billy thinks he should use one of these. Like one of the headset mics is undeniably better. <laughs> I was like, damn it. Those are the kind of jokes I write. I write jokes that are so dumb and small that part of it is like, oh, I can't believe someone took the time to think about that. 
Alex Edelman's big break on Broadway is still sinking in. I cannot stress how never this happens, Jacob. Comics who get to do Broadway are usually comedians. It's not usually their break, so this is like very nice for me. It's really cool. Just ahead, we're sharing some of our fave follows. Stay with us. We like to share our fave follows around here, the folks we are loving on social media. And today, we are introducing you to one of the coolest cooks. She's a California native who worked in fashion and tech for years before she realized she is happiest out in nature and when she's cooking. Hi, Hoda and Jenna. We are in the great outdoors. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. Welcome to the good life. <laughs> With her gourmet meals and stunning vistas, Kina P.A. is bringing her more than a half million followers out into nature. Y'all was nervous, huh? <laughs> After working in fashion and tech for years, the Californian knew she needed a change of scenery. I was trying to kind of figure out my life. I wasn't happy in my career, but I love spending time outdoors. And I just said, it's so beautiful. I'm gonna, I'm, I want to cook here. Two things that help with my mental health. Minding my own business <laughs> and king crab with garlic noodles. I started sharing the content online and it kind of just, just took off. We don't want to victimize people with our unseasoned foods. And she turned this passion for good food into a business. I'm really excited about my spice company called Hike and Spice, where my sister and I have created a harissa blend that people can take on the trail with them. All food is welcome, just like all people are welcome in the outdoors. Mother Nature does not discriminate. And this is why I do it, Hoda and Jenna. See you on the trail, or in New York. Kina! Okay, by the way, what a brilliant concept that yeah. was untapped until totally. you. And what an interesting merge. Yeah. Both like the beauty of being outside yeah. and then mm -hmm. cooking. You loved both. Loved both. Loved to cook, loved to hike. Use the two. You have to eat when you hike, right? Like yeah. you need and, and, sustenance. Yes, sustenance. <laughs> energy, right? And fried chicken is good energy. <laughs> But by the way, who would think you could make such delicious meals no, out there? I know, you would you think, think it'd be simplicity. limited, right? Yeah, yeah. What, are, what are you going to make for us? We are going to make a Mediterranean salad chicken crispy taco, which I'm really excited. I mean, who doesn't love tacos, right? Everybody loves tacos. And we tacos. have a salad, so there's health there. Okay, good. <laughs> it's health adjacent, right? <laughs> health adjacent. So, what, okay. so you just cut cute chicken. So we just chicken. cute some um, thighs, and we like, I like to use chicken thighs because they're juicier, right? Yeah, me too. Chicken thighs are, you know, she's the, she's the girl, so we like to use her. <laughs> okay. And then we have some great spices in here. One of the exciting things that I love is that we're using my OG Harissa, Amazing. my own spice ah. blend. Yeah, Hike and Spice Co. And you can go to Hike and Spice Co. to get those spices. Okay, cool. So we have the Harissa, the onion powder, garlic powder, and Greek seasoning. That's really so important. So you would pack your seasonings and your chicken yep. on the hike yep. and then and have, it have it in a little cooler. In a backpack and a cooler. Yeah, in a backpack and a okay, cooler. Okay, we don't want food poisoning. That's and, not no, great. No, no, I was going to say <laughs> salamonella and a hike. It's, it's not great. No, 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 girl. It's not good. Okay, so am I putting this in here? Yes. Okay. okay. So you pack your own uh, cast iron skillet too? Uh, no, I do. <laughs> no, because I really wouldn't be getting on the trail with a cast iron skillet. That's too much weight. So what I use is like a little nonstick packable okay. stove. Yeah, okay. got it. And skillet. And okay. then um, we're going to make mm. this delicious dressing. Okay. So okay. we want to crisp, crisp up. We do this. Crisp. Crisp. Yes. And we want to crisp this up. So we want a little bit of charcoal. I like to say like a little bit of color is flavor. Yes. Yeah, flavor, it's right? true, Melt right? Melt 
Right? Look at his flavor. <laughs> and then we're gonna do <laughs> We love your vibe. <laughs> we're gonna do the dressing. Jenna, yeah. do you like do you like do yeah. you, you I, like, like to, Yeah, do you wanna help me? Yes, ma'am, I'm happy to. Okay. And then, so is this um, red wine vinegar? Red wine vinegar. You can also use any type of vinegar. I like to have my recipes really simplistic. So if you don't have all the ingredients, you need the harissa, of course. Yes. But everything okay. else can you That's know, you can, your powder. Yes. No, this is the Greek powder. Oh, the Greek powder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we're gonna add in some olive, olive oil, oil, some salt mm-hmm. and pepper, some garlic. We always like to have garlic, right? We can add as much as we want because we're not, we're not kissing nobody today. Yeah. Go. So we're going to add that. Great. Okay. I love that. And then just mix whisk, that in. Whisk. And then yeah, you might want to mix it. You now, do you, do, do you both love like a Greek salad? We love, I love a Greek, Greek salad. salad. So these are all the parts that you would pack. Yeah. So we have feta, tomato, red onions, and cucumbers. Mix all this beautiful? up. It looks yeah. beautiful. We eat mix with our eyes up. first. So it oh, yeah, so yeah. gorgeous. Mm, it smells good. Should I add this? And then you're just going to add that on and mix it up. And mix it together. Everybody's getting married, having fun in their party. And then we're going to crisp up. Now, I like a crispy taco. Do you like a crispy taco? Yes. I do. I do, but Yes, yes, she yes. Does. And one of the reasons I love making this type of food because all food is welcome outdoors. You start, right? What I like was what you do is you start with a soft tortilla until you yeah. crisp corn, it up. Corn though, it has to be corn, corn not flour. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because you want it to be nice and crispy. Yeah, crispy. yeah, yeah. And then we're gonna just add in our chicken. So we're gonna add so in some put chicken it right here. Yep. There. And we already have it marinated. Beautiful. And, oh, and beautiful. That's crispy. gorgeous. Too, yeah. That. And cheese. now you could add some cheese. I love cheese, even though I like to say that I'm lactose in bondage because I can't get free from it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I cannot get free from cheese. Were you a stand-up comedian? No. I'm like, you definitely <laughs> have been. No, no, because laughter is, you know. But by the way, sometimes cheese you're going through it, is you the most delicious it, food it, group. Right? But you can omit this and not do the cheese. She's luckily it um, got over her lactose intolerance. <laughs> Why are we bringing that up again? <laughs> 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 we just should. Well, I wish I could be. That's what I'm trying to get. Well, I'm trying <laughs> to get to your yeah, yeah, still you're eating? my level of what I'm okay. So we're going to crisp that up, and then we are going to taste add it. Add the salad. Right? So you add the salad. We already have some here. You want to try it? I'm going to try one, and nice and crispy. You could add some lime to for the acidity, right? It's totally Which yummy. Be delicious, yeah. Totally yummy. And this will be fun with the kids, too. You could do mm-hmm. this and hike on the trail and have a good I'm meal. Like, that mm-hmm. is so awesome that you do that. It's really amazing, but okay. I want to just say okay. you're a genius because mm-hmm. I could no more hike on the trail and then cook this meal. Mm-hmm. Do you hike at all? I love hiking. You? Isn't it just... I, you, isn't it was it late. Just, it was wait, late. Wait, wait. <laughs> is, it, is hiking just walking? Yes. Okay. Any form like of outdoor that. activity is welcome. Yeah. I love that. Yes, Central I Park walking. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Now, it is time, excuse me, to officially add you to our fave follows huh. list. Another fave follow, these dads making a smile. They are blowing up social media with their sage advice. Take a look. Hi, my name is Taylor Kelmis. I am a husband, a proud father of four, and the creator of Dude Dad. Mr. and Mrs. Kalmus, hello. Uh, I do believe you know my client, Mr. Kalmus. We just want to be a happy little place on the internet where people can come, have a few laughs, and feel seen. Are you sure you don't have to go potty? Are you sure you're sure? Who are you when? <laughs> hold it, just hold it. I just hope to reach people where they are, whether it be in their marriage or in their journey as a father, and just show them that they're not alone in this and there's ways to laugh through the pain and to have fun with all of it. You ready, buddy? Yeah! Whoa! How was it? The reality is we only get a short amount of time with our kids before they're all grown up. It allows you to just go, you know what, the house is a mess, but let's go outside and play baseball. I just want my kids to know that anything they want to do, they can go for it and try, and they might fail, and that's okay. My name is Keir Gaines. I am a husband. I am a content creator. I am a licensed therapist. And I'm also a dad of two beautiful girls. The chance to love and be loved exists no matter where I am. On social media, most of my content is centered around mental health and takes these big mental health concepts and shrinks them down to something that's very easy to understand and easy to apply to your own life. I can't always control the things that happen in my life, but I can control the way that I respond. Three things I'm doing to be more of a positive parent. Make it a point to acknowledge your child's good behaviors even when they're not that remarkable. Those really tough parenting moments, I tell myself that my right now is not my forever. Do you need a hug or do you need some time alone? You need some time alone? All right, no problem. I'll check on you in about five minutes. I hope that if if nothing else, my girls see the value in kindness. Thank you. I hope that they're proud of me. I hope that I'm raising them in an environment 
where they can be good and they can be kind to the world and they can be good and they can be kind to themselves. My name is Rob Kenny and I'm the dad of two grown adults and I started the YouTube channel Dad How Do I? I'm going to show you how to use a stud finder. If you came here looking for help finding a boyfriend, that would be a different stud finder. I have cooking videos, I have basic car maintenance. Right here, connecting it to that. I do just about anything and everything that a dad would do. It sure shows you that that's way out of whack. There you go. My dad left uh, when I was 14 years old. I thought it would be a good idea to just download some information that I had to learn a lot of it the hard way. You want to just hand tighten these, but make sure they're snug. Being a dad is such a cool thing. It's such a blessing to have our kids in our home for a window of time. Hopefully I can encourage dads and kids to, hey, let's reconnect and put our phones down and spend some time together. We go around the, the back and come through. What matters to me is not so much that you'll learn how to tie a tie, it's that you learn and feel deeply within yourself that somebody cares for you. When we come back, we'll meet three women who are revolutionizing the beauty industry. Stay with us. on the boost meet three women revolutionizing the beauty industry while helping women look and feel their best the journey for me started when i was 10 years old me and my sister we are immigrants from nigeria when we first got to the united states we started getting bullied for the texture of our hair for isoken igbenadian it was the beginning of a complicated relationship with her hair. I remember the day I'd gone into class. I was sitting in the front row, and then the girl next to me started pulling on my hair and saying, why does your hair look like that? It's so weird. And so that day, I ran to my mom. I asked her to chemically straighten my hair. I wanted to really look like all the girls in my class. And she starts putting it in my hair. And so I start to feel like the burning sensation. But I'm thinking, oh, it's OK. This is the process to get the straight look that I really want to look like. And then she starts to wash my hair out. And at first, I'm thinking, oh my god, I can feel how soft and silky my hair is. And then I start to slowly run my hands down my hair, and I start to see chunks of hair falling out. Hair is such a huge part of your identity, right? And so I felt like I lost who I was at that moment. After graduating with a degree in business administration, Isokin embarked on a successful career in the tech industry, but yearned to find a way to use her knowledge of artificial intelligence to make a bigger impact. I didn't see any projects that I could work on where AOI was improving the lives of my community, of women and people of color who often have really poor product and service outcomes. And so we're just over it. As women who wear wigs and extensions, we wanted a better solution. That's really where Parfait was born. 
to make her dream of using AI to create high-quality custom-fitting wigs a reality, Isokin turned to her younger sister, Afueko, a computer science expert. Isokin has really been my partner in crime my entire life. You know, she was the one who taught me to put on makeup when I was in middle school, you know, so I immediately said, of course, like, let's write some code. And so we kind of went through that process. Like, I am a customer going online to buy a wig. What would make this easier? To get their idea into the hands of real customers, Isokin asked her friend and fellow warden classmate, Simone Kendall, to join the team. We had a conversation on a Thursday. <laughs> on a Tuesday, I was in a pitch, and we just have been, you know, rolling ever since. The app they designed simplifies the complex process of creating made-to-order wigs for individual customers. It just takes four pictures, and then within seven to nine business days, you'll get a fully custom bespoke wig delivered to your door. When word of their business got out, Serena Williams and Kelly Rowland wanted in, becoming early investors in the startup. Our wigs are truly for everyone because we're building every single one to the person. And so it's for anyone who needs a wig because you're suffering from hair loss. If you have the unfortunate event of going through a cancer or a medical reason and needing that wig, we have a lot of women that come to us for alopecia. We'll look at your exact photos and make sure that you have a wig that looks like you when you go out into the world. And that's a big deal, right? The women that are going through wearing wigs never want anyone to know they're wearing a wig. But it's even more crucial for women who didn't choose to wear a wig. Parfait for me means freedom, simply the freedom to be whoever you want to be every single day. Oh, Iso, Ifueko, Simone <laughs> joining us now. When you think about what you've accomplished in this moment, how do you reflect on that? Yeah, I really think more about just the impact I've been able to have to the customers who've been able to reach out to us, who've told us, like, we really have given them a product that has really changed their lives. Mm -hmm. It's really, really a difficult experience when you have some sort of hair loss. And so wigs and extensions are just a form and a way to express yourself, mm -hmm. your inner confidence mm -hmm. and your inner beauty. And so we get just so many customer reviews that say, oh my gosh, my wig is sitting with me in first class. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. And just the joy that it brings to the yeah. women who use these products, we're just wow. so grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fueco, I think one of the things that's most meaningful is that you get to do this with your sister. Mm -hmm. yeah. You guys have known each other since you were the little girls who, who who said, like, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm yeah. not gonna stand for this. What does it feel like to get to do it with these women you love so much? I mean, it's just a dream come true. And also to be able to use something that I've studied for so long yeah. to just make a difference in people's lives and working together with my sister to really make dreams come true. I think it's truly an unbelievable experience. Did you ever imagine that computer science totally. would come into play <laughs> in making wigs? Never, I mean, I think there's a lot of fear around tech. And yeah. when there are good people making really good algorithms that support people's problems and their experiences, we can really make tech such a positive thing. And that's what I love about Parfait. Mm -hmm. um, Simone, I, you, you ended the piece saying something that was so awesome, which is Parfait is freedom. Yeah. It's choice. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. It's giving women choice that maybe haven't had it before. Yep. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like to be part of that? It's incredible. I think for all women, you know, our hair is extremely intimate, but public at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that we walk into every room, every interaction with, and it's really a part of who we are. Did y'all freak out when Serena Williams oh, and really? Kelly, Kelly Rowland are like, <laughs> we lost our minds. We, 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 never, we mind. didn't believe it for a while. <laughs> yeah. We didn't think it was real. Yeah. We thought Edible. someone had like put um, a bar. <laughs> yeah. We're like, come on. By the way, just real quick, yeah. price point, because I think people are going to yeah. watch it and go, can I get yeah. it? Can yeah. I get it? What's the price yeah, point? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we start around 355, yeah. and there's different types of wigs. You can get a wig that really is just adding to your natural hair, where your natural hair is out, and yeah. you add it sort of around. Yeah. We have wigs that go from lace from here to here. Yeah. Um, those are super easy to use. And then mm -hmm. we have the lace that's like a full, you know, a 360 full yeah. Yeah. Okay. event. Um, <laughs> so it ranges okay. from there. But 355, you'll get started. Start. Yeah, it's okay. a great, cool. great wig for it. All right, okay, awesome. Coming up, we've got the latest viral video to boost your day. Do not miss it.
Welcome back to The Boost. It's about that time for our final story. And this one, it's sure to make you smile. Take a look. Have you ever had to fill in for somebody at work whose job is different from what you normally do? Well, that was the case for the Belgian shot putter <laughs> named Jolene Buomko. Jolene volunteered to compete in the 100 meter hurdles at the European Championships this weekend. Two of her teammates had to pull out because of injuries. Turned out, no one from Belgium competed in the event. Her team would have been disqualified from the whole thing. So she's selfless. The 12 time national shot put champion raised her hand and took one for the team. Right. She did it with a smile on her face. The race took her a little over 32 seconds, but it didn't matter because she picked up two points for her team. And then yes. afterwards, she said that. she was more than happy to take part. And she called that a special experience. She did better than I would have. Look at that. Yeah, it's the definition of a great sport. I like right. how she exactly. ran hard in between each she, hurdle. She's like, like, absolutely, I'll do it. Once a champion, always a champion. There you go. Doesn't matter what sport. There you go. That is it for today. We hope we were able to start your day off with a little positivity, and we will see you tomorrow with more of The Boost right here on Today All Day. Hey everyone and welcome to She Made It. I'm Jill Martin Brooks and for the next half hour, we will highlight a handful of seriously incredible women whose businesses help us feel and look cool. You're going to want to shop and support. So let's get started. I want to introduce you to Regina Merson, who immigrated to the U.S. from Mexico at just 10 years old and after a successful law career, made a life-changing pivot to makeup. Wearing makeup isn't necessarily about vanity, it's about self-empowerment. Makeup has always been front and center in Regina Merson's life. I love telenovelas, which are soap operas in Mexico, and they're very dramatic. It was the full face of 80s makeup, the main actress is crying, but like her mascara never budges, and her lipstick looks perfect. When Regina was 10 years old, she and her mom left their native country, Mexico, and emigrated to the United States. I get plopped into a new school. I spoke a little bit of English, but definitely not enough to consider myself fluent. Then, fast forward, and you have dreams of being part of the Supreme Court. I got here, and I was sort of determined to succeed as a form of learning how to assimilate. So, yeah, at one point in college, I thought maybe I'll be the first Latina on the Supreme Court. Who knows? Those big dreams led her to a big career. And after graduating from Yale undergrad and the University of Chicago Law School, Regina landed a job at a New York City law firm. But she knew there was something missing. I felt that I wasn't contributing to much of the like narrative around females, Latinas, and I really sort of craved to do something that would hopefully kind of empower women more. So Regina started taking business classes, which sparked an idea. A self-described junkie, Regina knew how empowering it could be to wear a full face of makeup. In our culture, you can be an intellectual and wear bright red lipstick. And regardless of, of what you do and what you do professionally, this is like part of the armor that we have in our day-to-day -day life. I love the idea of that, that those things don't have to be exclusive of each other. Regina decided to leave her law career and start her own makeup company, one that would also pay tribute to her proud Latina heritage. But she had to tell her family first. I think they were very nervous. I had this incredible job. Um, and I think for them, it was sort of like, why push it? You've achieved everything we ever wanted for you, and then some. But ultimately, I just 
you know, I was so determined to do this. So tell me about this brand. The name of the brand is Reina Rebelde, which means rebel queen in Spanish. She's this beautiful kind of pinup girl, but then below the neck, she's surprisingly, you know, covered in tattoos. So it was this idea of how we are sort of tattooed with all of the hopes, aspirations, dreams, wishes of all of those that came before us and how we carry those through. And I love the names, La Jefa, so La Jefa means Lady Boss. The names are inspired by feelings, really, that I want people to have when they are applying the product. Reina Rebelda hopes to celebrate the modern woman. Their bold colors and packaging paying tribute to various Latin American cultures. Beneath the Latina umbrella, we have everything from Mexicans to Dominicans to Puerto Ricans to Venezuelans. And within that, the skin tones go from the fairest to the darkest. So every product we created had to look good on every single skin tone. Regina's makeup soon made waves in the beauty community with publications like Glamour Magazine and Refinery29 featuring their eyeliners and lipsticks. And in 2021, the company partnered with JCPenney to sell their makeup in stores and online. What advice do you have for other Latinas who are looking to get into areas that could be challenging, but that can also be incredibly rewarding. I think the biggest piece of advice is to trust your gut. You have to be ready to confront a lot of failures and just kind of be willing to sort of pick yourself up and, and keep trying. And the company has expanded their retail presence and is now available at every JCPenney nationwide. I have some of the products here. They're so awesome and beautifully packaged. Well, coming up, from banking to baking, the founder of Sprinkles Cupcake shares her sweet story of success. We'll be right back. Welcome back to She Made It. Our next founder, Maureen Kelly, had no industry experience, no business experience, and employed friends to help her package products by paying them in pizza. But you'll see how the force behind her success was herself. Take a look. I had so many people tell me no along the way. And don't get me wrong, there were moments when I was definitely on my knees praying, but I made it. Maureen Kelly is the founder and CEO of the best-selling beauty brand, Tarte. And just like she says, she made it by being creative and scrappy. You've always been interested in makeup and beauty, right? Always, always, always. Since I was a little girl, I would take like red chalk into the bathtub and mix it with like shaving cream. And as I got older, I would make lip balms and bath bombs and things like that for friends and gift them. In 1999, at 23 years old, Maureen turned her one bedroom New York City apartment into a test kitchen, mixing all natural ingredients for products like her cheek stain. You have a degree in clinical psychology, no business degree, no beauty school. What gave you the guts and the idea that you could actually do this? I I'm not honestly sure. Even though I was whipping up things in my house, I needed to make many more of them. And so I opened up the good old yellow pages and started looking for labs and chemists. 
And of course, no one really picked up the phone. So then I drove there. You know, you fake it till you make it. And I convinced a lab to work with me. So how did you finance this at the beginning? I put it on credit cards. I had a credit card bill for $50,000 when all was said and done. And you know, when you don't really have any money in the bank, that's um, everything. That's everything. When I started calling Bergdorf's and Barney's and Bendel's, no one was calling me back. And then I started to really panic. Once again, Maureen took her fate into her own hands. I left a message for Henry Bendel's saying that Bergdorf's, a little bit of a white lie, saying that Bergdorf's was going to be signing us, but that I really wanted to launch in Bendel's and if they would please just let me show them the product, I knew that they would love it. And lo and behold, they called me back that day. Tarte officially hit shelves in Henry Bendel's in 2000 at a press breakfast. Magazines were at that press breakfast, and then I got into magazines. TikTok didn't exist, YouTube didn't exist, Facebook didn't exist. Magazines were the influencers of the day. And so I had stores across the country calling me to launch the product. Soon after, Maureen's mighty little company made Oprah's O-List and launched in Sephora, which has now carried the brand for two decades. Maureen credits her customers, who she calls Tartlets, for the strong foundation. We had a blog on Tart.com called Tart Talk because I wanted to hear from them. What are you liking? But also more importantly, what aren't you liking? I love them. They are how I am sitting here today and how Tart has grown and become what it is. In 2014, Tart was acquired by a parent company, Kose, allowing them to go global in stores across 23 countries worldwide. Do you look at what you've achieved and say, wow? This is a wow moment, right? The Oprah thing was a wow moment. There's lots of times in between, so much time in between. I never stop and feel like that, but I do feel very blessed. I feel very lucky. So, yeah. Oh, so with with tears in your eyes and now a flourishing bank account, what advice do you have for other entrepreneurs who feel like they have no money but this big idea and really want to do it? I say go for it, follow your dreams. I wasn't a makeup artist. I had no business experience. Tarte almost went out of business three separate times because I couldn't make payroll, but I did it and you can do it too. And Tarte had an amazing year last year, finishing as the number three makeup brand in the U.S., according to the NPD Group's Prestige Beauty Market Report. Tarte also reached one million followers on TikTok. Way to go. Now I want you to meet Candace Nelson. She left a finance job for cupcakes. Watch how she made the dough. In the media, we see these entrepreneurs that are glamorized for building, you know, rocket ships into space. But... I grew a really big business out of a simple cupcake. For Sprinkles Cupcakes founder Candace Nelson, her passion for baking started early. Was Easy Bake Oven in your life at that point? Of course I had an Easy Bake Oven. Who didn't? I grew up baking alongside my mom in the kitchen. Rice Krispie treats, cupcakes, you name it. She started her career in investment banking the dot-com bust happened. And instead of going to business school, I decided to go to pastry school. Everyone thought I was nuts. They thought I was having my quarter-life crisis. But the proof was in her baking. After pastry school, Candace began selling her own confection. I realized that special occasion cakes, people don't buy very often. I wanted to make something that people could enjoy every day. And I thought, here's this uniquely American treat. Everyone loves it. It's nostalgic and it's just been relegated to plastic clamshells. She set out to create an artisanal alternative of the familiar childhood treat. It was 2004 and people were used to spending 75 cents at the grocery store for their cupcakes. Right. Here I was charging $3 and it raised a lot of eyebrows. So what did you do to, to sort of say, okay, this is why this is worth it. I stood behind that cupcake counter and explained the value of my product until I was blue in the face. Still, some weren't convinced. People told me that this idea would never work. It was the height of the low carb craze. We were opening a first of its kind cupcakes only bakery in the middle of Beverly Hills. Soon after, word about Candace's cupcakes started to spread. 
And then we opened to lions out the door. But it was one phone call that changed everything for Sprinkles Cupcakes. It was a producer from the Oprah Winfrey Show telling me that Oprah loved my cupcakes. And they said, you can have 350 of them in Chicago tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. So I fired up the ovens, baked up those 350 cupcakes, piled them high in shopping bags, and took a red eye to Chicago. We were the most annoying people going through the airport because we had to take each box out of the shopping bag and run through the security. Like, sorry, everyone, Oprah's calling. The Oprah Show thrust sprinkles into the spotlight, and overnight, Candace's 600-square-foot bakery in Beverly Hills became a hit. The lines were wrapped around the block. It was unbelievable. So did that lead to you taking private equity money? When did you decide to make that flip from self-investing? At a certain point, I didn't want to hold the business's growth back. I didn't know that I was necessarily the one to take it from 10 locations to 30 or 40. That decision paid off. To date, Sprinkles has sold over 200 million cupcakes and has over 40 locations nationwide. And in 2017, Candace fired up a new business, Pizani. Love elevating simple pleasures, sort of surprising and delighting people with foods they thought they knew. And pizza is one of those. Now Candace is sharing her secrets in a new book. You have a book behind you. You're already a best-selling cookbook author. My new book, Sweet Success, is all about how I came up with the idea for Sprinkles, scaled it, built it, protected it in this sea of competition. So when I say she made it, you're like, woohoo! Absolutely, and as women, we need to get better about looking at challenges we've overcome, looking at the triumphs, because those are the building blocks to confidence. Really hard for me to not eat the set. Well, our original She Made It feature on Candace and Sprinkles aired in November before the holidays. Sprinkles then enjoyed a healthy bump in sales, making this past holiday season one of their biggest yet. Well, up next, how one pattern inspired three friends to start a line of everyday clothing essentials. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. I recently met three friends and fashion insiders who had a collective 30 years of industry experience under their belts before they launched their brand, Laleen. We go back to these pieces that make you feel great, and we aim to be those pieces in your life. For Valerie McCauley, Meredith Melling, and Molly Howard, the inspiration for their clothing brand was simple. What is the DNA of Laleen? It starts and begins and ends with the stripe and the line. 
It's clothes that you can start off in the morning and then hopefully go to cocktails at night and still look effortless and beautiful and comfortable. In 2004, Valerie and Meredith met while working as fashion editors for Vogue. We also were really familiar with each other's work ethic. I always second guess myself and she's like so follows her gut and I knew that that was such a good you know, professional compliment, probably personal as well. They became fast friends after noticing a shared interest. We also were commuting to and from work on the subway and we'd get off and I'd be like, there were five people in stripes mm -hmm. and you know, they were all ages, sizes, you know, genders, men, women, kids, the possibilities were kind of endless. It's almost back to the basics in an elevated way. So do you think that's where fashion's going? You want to trust your clothes to, to be able to carry you through. But the pair needed someone who knew the business. So they reached out to Molly, who was head of business development for fashion label Rag & Bone. I sort of thought they were coming to me for advice. And if I knew anyone who might be a good fit to be kind of the third partner. And I remember my friend said to me, they're asking you to take the job. They want you to be their third partner. They want you to be the CEO. With Molly on board, the Laleen team was complete. Their goal? to create clothing that celebrates simplicity by embracing the stripe. Historically, the horizontal stripe is something that every mother, or most mothers, my mom did, said, don't wear a horizontal stripe. We do these things called founders fitting, so we all three of us try on the collection, and on other people in the office as well, different body types. And it's, you know, it's where the stripes fall, it's draping, it's fabrication. We're sitting in this store smiling and everything's beautiful on the racks, but I know that the path to success is bumpy. It's been a real journey. I mean, just to be blunt, like, every day was a challenge. We were working out of Meredith's apartment. We were not paying ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I have your kids barking and your dogs. dogs. <laughs> and usually someone from design team was already in my apartment. Even when we launched our website, which was our big launch, um, all sitting around my dining room table. We had a wild first day. I mean, it was yeah. all over the press and we got so much traffic and we sold so much inventory and it was incredible. After that wild day, the brand started to take off, but not before the founders learned an important lesson. We realized something had to change about the way we were delivering product mm -hmm. because just launching a whole collection and then expecting people to come back day after day without any new noise wasn't going to work. So they began releasing new designs each week and the industry took notice. Soon celebrities like Mindy Kaling, Amy Schumer and Olivia Wilde were spotted in Laleen. And in 2019, they launched their flagship boutique on Madison Avenue in New York City. The best, most successful pieces were the ones that we ended up wearing every day and that we wanted and that we could see ourselves in. Most recently, Laleen partnered with Target for their 2022 fall designer collection. And we're so excited about the exposure, the size inclusivity that Target's able to offer, the price accessibility, and now we're starting to see it in the wild. I can't find it anywhere, <laughs> so dig everybody, because yeah. if you go to Target, there's yeah. like a few pieces left. Through it all, Meredith, Valerie, and Molly have stayed true to themselves. Not everyone's going to love everything you're doing, because I think when you start trying to make everyone happy, you're just, you're inauthentic, right? That's a life lesson, though. Any other advice for young entrepreneurs out there? Always take the meeting. I love your, that's yeah. Val's favorite advice, and it's true. And it's true. Yeah. It's just, you, you never know when the next great thunderbolt might arrive mm. from. So yummy and delicious. Well, Laleen has since celebrated their seventh anniversary by bringing back some of their most loved styles, and they're opening their fifth store later this year outside of San Francisco, and they just came out with a great line of jeans, so check them out. All right, next up, our next founder, Marissa Morrison-Stein, turned her passion for DIY and crafts into a colorful company. For as long as I can remember, I always enjoyed creating things. Jewelry, themed parties, magazines, you name it. After graduating college, I worked in e-commerce, but in 2016, my employer closed. So I turned back to writing and started blogging about my DIY projects, making my own home decor and accessories. Fully embracing my colorful creativity brought me such joy that I wanted to share it with others. So in 2017, with my husband Sam by my side, I launched the Neon Tea Party, teaching workshops and selling craft kits from my tiny New York City apartment. After three years, I was excited to move into our own space, and then the pandemic hit, and we were forced to break the lease. But that didn't stop us. 
In three months, we've hosted more than 20 virtual workshops and shipped over 900 packages to fellow crafters. We are on a mission to provide creativity and calm to others during these times, and it makes me so happy to keep the party going. Well, after their She Made It feature in June 2020, the Neon Tea Party saw a surge in sales of their craft supplies and kits. Well, from crafting to gardening, Tashana Richardson had a seed of an idea that she grew into a blooming business. Eleven years ago, as I was struggling financially and looking for a job, I discovered gardening as a way to manage stress. But I'll be the first one to tell you I was not born with a green thumb. One day, a plant I had neglected for a couple of weeks was showing signs of life, bearing over 20 fruits. I couldn't believe it. So my dad loaned me $100 to do some research, and it was the jumpstart I needed. Through a lot of trial and many errors, I found a way to grow herbs indoors like basil and lettuce, even without soil. Soon, my passion for planting sprouted into a business, and I launched Cocoa and Seed in 2013. Since then, I've been selling and shipping indoor gardening kits and doing everything from photography to customer service. Today, Cocoa and Seed is committed to sustainability and making gardening easy for all them. And Coco and Seed's hydroponic garden kits have also been included as one of Oprah's favorite things. So amazing. Well, coming up, a model turned entrepreneur who created an Indian inspired beauty line with rituals passed down from her family. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, international model Pritika Swaroop is infusing her Indian roots and mantra of skin and soul into a contemporary skincare line that's skyrocketing in popularity. Here's her story of how she made it. In my career, everyone told me I could only have one path and be very good at one thing and I just never wanted to limit myself. For international model Pritika Swaroop, Beauty starts from within. I really just wanted to bring Indian beauty to the forefront of the industry and to all women. Pritika is the founder and CEO of Proxy Beauty, an Indian-inspired skincare line that emphasizes Ayurvedic rituals passed down from her family. If you think of Ayurveda, you think of skin and soul, because if you're not feeling good on the inside, then you can't glow and you can't be the best version of yourself. Growing up in Virginia, Pritika was set on becoming an eye surgeon, just like her dad, until a family trip changed everything. I was scouted as a model at Disney World. It was just like such a shock because that was never something I thought I would do. How did that happen? Mickey Mouse was like, you're beautiful. No, there was a model scout. It was just kind of a very smooth approach. Like, hey, have you ever thought about modeling? We were like, no. And then kind of looked into it more and realized it could be a huge opportunity. So at 17 years old, Pritika moved to New York City and made the leap into modeling, all while attending Columbia University and graduating with a degree in finance. But while working as a model, 
Pritika noticed a gap in traditional Indian brands that were accessible to a Western audience. So what did you feel like wasn't represented? I think that Ayurveda in, just, in general just feels very foreign and intimidating and basically it's a science of life. So Pritika set out to create a skincare brand that married both worlds. Western beauty is all about addressing like physical concerns, you know, whether it's hyperpigmentation or acne and then in India, it's all about feeling good on the inside. Pritika dove into research, meeting with women in India, and learning more about the herbs that are utilized in Ayurveda. And with her personal savings, she launched Prakti Beauty in September 2021. Where do you start with ingredients? Well, I grew up with these remedies and rituals and using a couple of key ingredients that I just like love the most. Like what? So, I mean, ashwagandha, turmeric, these are ingredients that I would be making like mass in the kitchen with my mom. So just growing up with her helped set that foundation. Your family must be so proud of you to take what you learned growing up. There must be such a sense of pride. Yeah, my parents are very excited and happy and they're really my biggest cheerleaders. Like my mom, I mean, she's just always so excited to try the next product. And so was I. Devi Detox Purifying Face Cleanser. So Devi means divine in Hindi. It has this beautiful jasmine aroma, pretty polish. Okay. So you have this sativa rice powder. That is amazing. It's also important for Pritika to give back. As a global ambassador for Operation Smile, a nonprofit that helps children with cleft conditions all over the world. It was just something very important for me to just be able to spotlight what these children are going through so that people understand that they need to be included and just embraced in society because they're beautiful. The model and entrepreneur is proving that she can do it all, and she's just getting started. We want to inspire women to fearlessly pursue multidimensional lives and let them go out and do everything they can do. Procti Beauty nearly sold out after their Today Show feature and in the last six months have seen a 500 plus increase in sales. We just love to hear that. Well, that's all for our She Made It Summer Edition. Thanks for watching. And remember, scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Jill Martin Brooks, and I'll see you next time. Today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bowers here to show us how to make our own frozen yogurt. Joy, good morning to you. I want to get right to it. We got the cookie dough frozen yogurt bites. You start hey by making homemade cookie dough. Go ahead. Hey, guys. So in light of the heat wave, we are making two crazy, refreshing summer treats, and we're starting with cookie dough frozen yogurt. So I'm going to start by making the cookie dough here. And the great part is it is super simple to make and it comprises of nourishing ingredients. And the first thing is this almond flour. So it's gluten free and it already has some protein in it. I'm going to add a pinch of salt, a little bit of peanut butter, about a quarter cup here. And for sweetener, I'm adding a dash of maple syrup and a little bit of vanilla extract. And you mix this up. And I hope that you can see this, but thanks to the almond flour, it transforms into a crumbly, almost pasty-like cookie dough. And the last thing we're going to do here, because I like chocolate chips in my cookie dough, I'm going to add in, if you have mini chocolate chips, great. But if not, I just have the regular stuff right here. And I'm going to toss in a couple of tablespoons of either dark or mini or semi-sweet chocolate chips. So I have this over here. And all you're going to do now is roll these into little, almost chickpea sized balls. So let me show you. And it's nice and pliable. I'm gonna put it in the palm of my hand, just like this. See that? And you could get your kids involved. Everybody could start a big rolling party over here. And I'm putting it on parchment paper so it doesn't stick right on the baking sheet. And then this entire batch is going to make about 80. And I stash this right in the freezer because you want them to slightly firm up. Now, while they're in the freezer, we're going to go ahead and we're going to make our froyo. So here I'm using um, two cups of full fat Greek yogurt. Normally, I like to use either non-fat Greek yogurt or 2%. But because I want these super creamy and um, crave-worthy like ice cream, I'm using full fat. Any sweetener that you'd like. Here I'm putting in honey, but this could even be coconut sugar or it could be a sugar replacement. 
if you're looking to pull back on your added sugars and a little bit of vanilla extract. We mix this up and now we're going to add in all of our cookie dough balls and you stir this up and you put it in a mini muffin container and you just let it freeze. And I'm gonna show you what my muffin container looks like because it could not be any easier. And guys, these are light in calories, they're packed with protein and they'll last for up to a month in your freezer. So you could transfer them right into a freezer bag and they will be waiting for you when you have any kind of a sweet tooth craving. So next, we're gonna make something really special and these are PB and J pots. So here I'm starting with my sliced strawberries and this is gonna become our wholesome jam. And I'm just gonna muddle my strawberries so you get it nice and juicy. Then I'm gonna be putting in my peanut butter. And again, this is gonna be um, Greek yogurt, but it's gonna be flavored. So we don't even have to add any sweetener, either a berry flavor or a vanilla flavor. And you just mix this up and then you're gonna put it right into your popsicle mold. And you're gonna let that freeze. It's a nice thick batter. I'm gonna show you what this looks like. I have some frozen right over here. Look at this. Ta-da! But we're not done yet because we're gonna bedazzle them now. So here I'm, I'm filling my, my, my uh, popsicle mold and you put that right in the freezer and now I'm drizzling some chocolate on top and peanuts. <laughs> Look at that, guys. I mean, come on, you know you want a bite of this. Okay, it's the middle of July and we know the temperatures are just soaring down there. So what a better way to cool off than with everyone's favorite summer treat, ice cream. And today we're going to show you how easy it is to make at home with the help of Justin Chapel, culinary director at Food & Wine Magazine. Mm. Homemade ice cream, huh? Yes. Well, we're making a soft serve today and we're making a version that's just like, you know, a little bit healthier. Okay. We love that. We love that. We, we still want that treat. We still want to cool down in the summer, but... We could, you know, yes. take care keep of ourselves our, a little bit better. <laughs> but it's not totally healthy. Uh, but it's good for you because we're starting with frozen fruit. Okay, okay. frozen mangoes, if you have never tried one, because I hadn't, are like little popsicles. Yeah, frozen, especially the champagne mangoes yeah. are super yummy. Yes, and All we right. talked about And by the way, these ladies have been picking at my mangoes here. I sure so. have. Is that okay with you? <laughs> it's perfectly okay. okay. All right. um, so we've got about a pound and a half of frozen mangoes. Okay. You can also use blueberries. Yeah. You can use strawberries. Whatever your fruit is. Whatever what your is fruit this? is. So this is the secret ingredient. Let me guess. And this, Do you know? Condensed milk. Yes. <gasps> Sweetened condensed milk. So, so here's the thing. This yeah. is why it's maybe like not super healthy okay. because it's got a lot of sugar, but this is the secret Yummy. ingredient. Yummy. So we're gonna add the sweetness, but we're also going to add really creamy texture look here. Yeah, look it looks that. I mean, look at that. Mm -hmm. But pudding. And if you wanted, you can even use dolce de leche here. Oh. Which is basically the same thing better. but caramelized, yes. Yeah. Okay, do you add salt and vanilla? Yep. I'll let you add just, oops, this is, look at me shaking. It's my oh. first time back. <laughs> I know, we're so happy to have you here. A pinch of salt. Okay. I kind of like the salt and sweet, Yes, you know? so we've got a little vanilla to give us a little warmth, okay. but then the salt is gonna enhance all this flavor. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna pulse this. Yeah. So just, it gets creamy. Yep, and you're just gonna puree it. And it takes a few minutes, but then this is what you end look, up look with here. Look how gorgeous here. that in a is. Little cake pan. And of and course you, you could serve it. it right, yep, you could serve it right out of there, and then actually that's when it's in its soft serve form. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if you put pop it into a freezer safe container, pop it in the fridge, it'll get a little more firm. Amazing. Okay. Firmer. Oh, oh. Now we chop up the chop up. Yes. So we have our soft serve ice cream, yeah. right? But we're ready. let's talk about nostalgia. And remember when we were kids eating soft serve dipped in the yes. in the chocolate? Oh, I love that. Yes. Yeah, 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 so yeah. we are making a DIY chocolate shell. Starts with a bar of bittersweet chocolate, about okay. a pound that you chop. Okay. okay. Now this is actually important here because. Um, you don't want to use chocolate chips because chocolate chips are actually formulated to hold their shape. Oh, uh, really? So yeah. you just got to bang that up. So you want to bang yeah. it out mm -hmm. and um, chop it. This is bittersweet. You can also use semi-sweet. You're going to add some coconut oil. Coconut oil? Oh my oil. gosh, she loves coconut oil. Coconut oil. And so a pound of coconut oil, about a half a cup of coconut <laughs> oil. Does. And you're going to microwave this in 20 second intervals. Put it in the micro. 20, yep, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, until it melts. Now, the reason you're doing 20 second yeah. intervals is because you don't want to overheat your chocolate. You don't what the, happens if you overheat the it? The sugars clump and then they separate from the fat oh, no. and then you get this dull but mix. Look at yeah, this. But look, look at this. Yeah, look what you did. Stir it. Look at this. Now, by the way, this has been at room temperature for like an hour and a half. <gasps> and it's okay. And it's okay because the coconut mm. oil, which is Told liquid you. at room temperature, it keeps this sort of liquid texture. Okay. And then what happens when this 
hits something really cold, mm -hmm. it's gonna solidify. Okay, so you're oh. okay. Let's make our sandwich. This yes. is so exciting. I know, we love ice cream okay. sandwiches. So okay. we're using our mango soft serve here, yeah. and this has put, been put in the fr freezer for just a little bit, so it can get yeah. a little firm. Otherwise, it might be a little mm. squishy. I'm gonna put a little bit on there. I'm gonna let you do the honors here. Put this One on of top, you, and then yep. you dunk. Okay, I'll okay, you can well, dunk. you're not actually going to dump oh, that one oh, yet, but okay. so, but you, you could use can we dunk cookies, these? wafers. Yes, those are your dunkers. Is that because they're yeah, colder? I'll switch places with you. Do you have to put them in the I fridge you both before to... you dunk? Yes. So the trick is you want oh. it to be as cold as possible. It's cold. Because, because the coconut oil, which okay. is liquid at room temperature, when it touches something cold, how, it solidifies. Just around half of it? Yeah, half or Look all of it. Look how gorgeous that is. So you put it down here. You put it oh. down, and it'll start to get firm immediately. You Which can see you the want? edges here. I'll have this one. Okay, I'll have this one. You know what you could do even to up it what? a little bit? What? Is to dip that in sprinkles. Sprinkles or chopped nuts mm -hmm. or, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. non-pareils mm -hmm. would be really pretty. How do you bite Look that? Look at that. Mine can I hard. steal one of these from you? Please. Oh my god. That's I'm gonna do yummy. a blueberry. Blueberry's mm. my favorite here. Although I don't know if I'm gonna take a bite, I'm just gonna hold it. A sweet summer treat, especially one that cools you down on a real hot, sticky mm -hmm. day. We're super lucky because our culinary producer, Katie Stilo, came up with a couple <laughs> of delicious <laughs> treats that will really hit the spot for the entire family. And then there's just one for the grown ups, yeah, too. A little what? treat, a little you know. treat. I know. Katie, you don't disappoint. All right, okay, what are we starting? I'm trying not to. We started the week with some cool treats. We're going to finish it with some. Awesome. So I'm yeah. going to share my banana bread recipe. What I'm doing to bump it up a notch, I'm turning it into ice cream cake. Hello, who a doesn't love that? Bread, banana bread, Mary, ice, ice cream, cream cake. cake. By the way, that sounds awesome. Okay. Your birthday's coming up, yes. so maybe you can make this. So in here, I have my flour. I have some baking soda and salt. Jenny, you want to stir that up? Yes. Mm -hmm. In my stand mixer, already creamed together. I have some sour cream. I have butter, and then a little bit of brown sugar. Ooh, brown you can sugar. use light. Sure, you can, can use dark. Whatever you have available. Like, don't okay. go crazy. And then, Hoda, if you want to mash up some bananas, oh, I'll crack some what's eggs. The, what's the like secret with that? Do you want old bananas? Do you or want super ripe bananas? Brown. So like Can brown, be? spotty. The Can best be? ones if you get them and they're ripe and you're not ready to make banana bread. But I mean, I'm always ready. So yeah. <laughs> put what them in the freezer. Even if they're too brown, too brown, it's totally fine. Okay. It'll, it'll just be sweeter. Your banana bread will just be sweeter. Yeah, it's yeah totally but fine. we're okay with that. Exactly. Like, like that. who who does not like that? Okay, so I'm gonna add some eggs into here. Mm -hmm. Jenna, you want to scoop in the dry ingredients? Sure. Jump those right in. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. And then I'm adding some chocolate chips because this banana bread ice cream cake is inspired by, I know you guys were recently there at Ben yeah. & Jerry's. Yeah. Scooping oh, yeah. some ice cream. So, do you know, you, you chunky monkey. Even it's with like a chunky thing? monkey ice cream so cake. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now, I, now we can add this into here. And then I like to add a little bit of lemon Wait, juice. I'm adding this to that. Yeah. Yeah. This is one. And where am I adding the lemon juice? In here? Into the batter. Oh, All goes in. Just dump everything lemon? in. Lemon? Yeah, I like Are it. I think it adds. Sure? I swear, trust me. I, have I led you wrong so far? No, no I haven't. Not. I'm not. Okay, am I just? Kidding? I think it adds a little bit of acidity and it's a little tang. I think it helps it out a little bit. Okay, cool. Okay, okay so, so moving down out. here, I have a batter and I'm baking it. So instead of baking it in a nine by thirteen or yeah. a eight by eight That's low pan, like. pop it into a cake pan. Look at this. And so and you so do it's more of a cake. Right. So you can mm. bake this if you want to, mm. just as is, and eat it as banana bread. Sprinkle it with some turbinado sugar on top. I love the crunch mm. that it brings. Yes. And then here we have the finished baked layer and my trick to make 
making this ice cream cake really easy to remove is popping it into a cake pan and then lining it with these little parchment overhangs. Yeah. So okay. it helps you pop it out. So then I'm topping it so with peanut butter. So you popped it and turned it over? Right. Let it cool. So and then the flat side exactly. is there to a little, ah. a little chef tip for you. And you Wait. have to let it cool, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And it'll be a hot mess. Okay. Sure. So peanut butter, first layer. Because mm. if it's Chunky Monkey, you need that. And yes. then... Obviously, it's summer. Wait, what's going so on here? So we're doing is that vanilla ice cream. Ice cream. Vanilla ice cream. You could do kind of any kind of ice cream here. No, you can you go wild. Vanilla. But no, you do no. vanilla. Or banana. Exactly. And then you're going to top it with the top. Wait, look what's happening here. This is amazing. It's like the ultimate. What? I know. It's the now ultimate. You freeze it? Freeze the whole thing. Can and we then save Miss Burhoda's birthday, yeah. please? Oh, <laughs> look at this. Wait, what's <laughs> happening? Pretend I made it. I look at this. And then uh, we're gonna oh, wait, we're gill not the lily. No, not okay, done I'll yet. come this way. Okay. You can take a bite. I'm just drizzling it over Put the top. Put this one, one in the freezer part. till yeah. August <laughs> what? Eighth? Ninth. Ninth. Okay, it's my close. birthday though, so we can do it on the eighth. Wait, birthday's the eighth? Yeah, we're Leo twins. This morning we are snacking in today food. Recipe developer and food blogger Rachel Mansfield is known for sharing her easy good for you cooking demos on social media. I'm so excited for this because as I told you, I have boys in the house that eat nonstop and snack time is my least favorite time of the day. Well, but it is our this could time. change that. Yes, no, I'm super excited. So we're going to be making two of my favorite snacks. I personally love them and then I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home and they devour them. So kid approved. So first we're going to be making frozen yogurt cups. Who wants to lead the, uh, who wants to cook today? I'll go for it. I'll do it. it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this is one of my son's most recent favorites. It's good mm -hmm. for my one-year-old who's teething and three-year-old who wants to eat ice cream all the time. Ah. So you take a silicone muffin tin, mm -hmm. put a layer of yogurt, and then you can put some berries, which we already okay. have. So you can mix some more berries. Is it seasoned at all, or is it just plain yogurt? So I like yogurt. using an unsweetened, mm -hmm. like plain yogurt, just okay. to keep the sugar content a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. But oh, if really... you want something that has uh, more sugar, you can put some honey or maple syrup, or really anything that you want, even some coconut sugar. Mm -hmm. um, you can put fruit, and then you put granola. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I always like a little bit of a crunch. And then on top of the fruit, you'll put some more yogurt and drizzle some peanut butter on top. Oh. And keep them in the freezer. And they're almost like a little either pick it up. healthy snack on the go. You can have them as like a dessert mm -hmm. of sorts. So um, when, once they're thawed from the freezer, do they... Do they um, you have to give it a second? Melt? Yeah. They kind of yeah. fall give it away. Yeah, because this one is. They honestly don't melt as fast as you would think that yeah. they do. I make a yogurt bark, and that mm. definitely melts a little bit faster, mm -hmm. but these stay pretty frozen for a while. And how do you make um, this peanut butter so nice and drizzly? Just drizzled it. So you, if your peanut butter is a little bit thicker, you can melt it with some, um, put some coconut oil in okay. it and then microwave it to get it a little bit more mm. like drizzleable. And you can so use easy. almond butter, cashew butter, uh -huh. anything you want. Okay. Everybody was fun fascinated by banana sushi. Work. I know. But it, I know. And it, when you say it, it kind of sounds a a little weird like am uh -huh. I eating sushi or like I'm eating bananas but this is was like my late night mm. snack in college so oh. this has been like my go-to for a while banana uh -huh. sushi all right it let's so do good. it mm. so you take a banana you peel right. it okay you can use any nut butter or seed butter you want like a tahini peanut butter almond butter cashew butter anything okay. Lather the banana with it. Okay. If you want to get like a little bit messier, you could do the entire thing. If you want to be a little mm -hmm. bit cleaner, you kind of do like, I would say three fourths of it. Okay. And once you have the nut butter on, you take any toppings you want. So we have some coconut flakes, cacao nibs, granola, and okay. it gives it like a little bit of a crunch. You just roll and you it? just coat it. Yeah, you can either take your hands and you can sprinkle oh, it, or I you can take the banana and actually roll it if you want. Okay. Banana and it's sushi. A it's a good activity for kids. Like my son loves Oops, doing it at home. We also even take like, on top of the peanut butter, take a tortilla, uh -huh. oh, roll it up, and oh, crisp nice. it on the stove. Ooh. So it's like kind of like a caramelized banana, yeah, yeah of sorts. That looks I beautiful. It, I didn't get it on the other side. I was no, trying to. No, it's fine. You can even put the coconut on top. And Al's just having a party over yeah, there. Yeah, that's right. It's a banana party. <laughs> your I mean, you're a banana. You, it's like an omakase from banana sushi over that's here, it. Right, <laughs> right? Look how nice hers look over here, guys. And I know. <laughs> and then you slice that up, and then you can enjoy. I also like keeping these in the freezer with those, so it's like an easy grab and go snack. The bananas don't get very Brown, being in the freezer, mm. which is why I like putting them there. And again, my kids love them, I love them, and they're super easy to Look make. The presentation there, I love that. Thank, Thank you. you. If you want to get real fancy, you can even use the chopsticks too. I know. Can oh. I sing your praises? You're so big, like on TikTok, social. People really love you. Thank you. And I think this is why. I mean, these Thank are doable you. things and get us all to eat. Thank all right. you so much. Too. I appreciate Thank that. Thank you so much. Yeah, right. thanks Rachel. for having me. We appreciate mm -hmm. it. And for these recipes, you can head to today.com slash food. <laughs>
Oh my god, okay, right? it's but also you know what you have? You what? have hacks. I have hacks. I yes. love this. So this is a great qu and quick party drink. Yes. Yeah. Tell us what it is. Well here's it's not so much about the drink. I mean you can put your special yeah. vodka mojito in yes, here you if can. you'd like. Okay. But what this is about, it's keeping the flies and the buggies out of your drink. Oh, it's when a you're hat. out in the sun. It's a hat for a drink. It's a hat for the drink. Oh. So you just take a cupcake liner, poke your straw. It through, just keeps it off. Yes. And it keeps yeah, and it protects it so you don't right. get the it, little bugs. It doesn't in there. seal it, but it does the job. Oh, you exactly. want this. This is just some great That's water with lemon, water. which is good for our You know, little water. bonus hack, keep your lemon and lime slices in the freezer during the summer, and then you pull them out when you is need them. Is that what you did? Because yeah. this is so That's cold. That's why it's nice and cold, and then you don't need that, like, um... So, wait, do you slice them first, then put slice it... Slice them first and then freeze put them. It in because the then that way you don't... Do you ever do, like, you have half a lemon sitting around yes, and it dries and, then it goes and dies? Bad. Yes. yes. That always happens. So you can prevent that. Okay. Another easy, fun thing to do. Mm. I love sangria, mm. right? So this is my, Me like, too. hacked sangria. Okay, tell us. All you need is wine. You can do white or uh, red. red wine. Okay. Bag of frozen berries. Drop them in. Wait, and I love what? this because you can take <gasps> this to the beach. Wait, that's all you do? Yeah. So basically, like, you take this to the beach, you combine the bag and the bottle of wine. You can add a little seltzer if you want, you know, splash What does traditional else. sangria have that? Traditional sangria would be uh, the wine, and you would do, like, apples and oranges apples and stuff. And oranges. But I think this is a great summer. So just version. fruit and wine. That's yes, what, okay. Fruit and wine. You can add right. a little cognac this, or something if you want. This looks yummy. So I like a sweet. A twist on the waffle cone. Breakfast waffles. I mean, that's ridiculous. You cut them in half. Ice cream so, in there? Yeah, so you film, you spread ice cream. Top, yeah, you close them, and then you put sprinkles on the side. Pop them in the freezer for like four hours. You can, and if these are homemade waffles, Yummy. but you could also do really. You could buy like do the frozen waffles too, just make your life even easier. I love that, I and love kids that. would love that. Easy to get. Grown That's a great it, like right? ice cream sandwich. It. I love it. <laughs> okay. Substitute. What's okay, uh, so then you take those berries, including the blueberries. You could do frozen. You can do fresh. So it's summer. They're amazing now. I say go with the fresh ones. Put them in a little popular. ramekin. Toss them with just some sugar, a little bit of cornstarch, just to hold them together. Cookie dough. Store-bought frozen wait, wait, cookie wait, dough. What is, is that? Is this, yes. is this a take wait, on yes. your cobbler? This is a take on cobbler. So this is just sugar wait, cookie hold dough. hold on. You just put it on the just top? Just little chunks of it right on top. 350 in the oven just until the berries start bubbling. And How you put a peach in there too, which is yeah. my favorite okay. kind of cobbler. Would you explain kind of, something? So yes. you just put, there's nothing on the bottom, just so, no, blueberries? No, literally just berries, uh, any kind of frozen oh fruit or fresh fruit. Toss it with some cornstarch to kind of hold it together. Isn't that awesome? That is. Yeah. And you can have fun with the cookie doughs. I like the sugar cookie dough, but I mean, if you want to do chocolate chip, I'm not going to judge Yeah, you. and you could put oats. Yeah. Maybe you could put oats in there, too. Ooh, what do you yeah. mean? I like, like oats for the in little my crumb. She wants, like, the crumble type yeah, thing. Yeah, I do. So, yeah. It's I like that. You can do that. Hey, what's your favorite summertime drink? We said ours. Yes. Well, I like a mojito, but I do mine with with rum. Yeah. Okay. Tell yeah. me how you make it. Okay. Yeah. I will say your mojito recipe is unfamiliar to me. I, I do not recognize that as a mojito. What part of it? I, what part of it was like, weird? No, the diet well, um, ginger ale? None, none of it. Because. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Puerto Rican. You know, okay. I'm a Latina girl, so I start with okay. rum. Okay. Um, you do limes and mint. You got that part. The muddling in the bottom of the glass. Mash them muddle, up. Muddle, 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 muddle. Right, Get right. all those like natural flavors okay. out. See how she does it. Some brown. Brown sugar. Wait, what? There. Brown sugar. Yeah, brown sugar is usually yes. Mojito. Think about it. This is from the islands, right? This, Nobody told this me. This is a Cuban okay, then cocktail. What? So brown sugar. Then you do the rum, and then ice, and then you can just top it off with a little bit of seltzer. So your soda isn't that far off. I just do a little club soda. Yum. I really like the, the keep the rum. How much? Pure. Can I ask? How much brown sugar do you put in there? Just like a tablespoon. So no agave. Not, yeah. Well, it depends what size. If you're doing it one in a glass and just like a teaspoon, a tiny if you're bit. doing a big one, then you can do like a tablespoon. All right. You can do that. I mean, agave is good too. I would right. say our cocktails are like cousins. Show us oh, and in here, I've got one more oh, thing for you. Oh, yeah, sorry. So this is a cool product. You get this, uh, Food 52 has them. So berries, if you wash them too soon, they, they get bad. They get bad I because know, they're that so delicate. To us. That skin so is what do you do? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, because yes. these berries are, like, very, very delicate. That, like, skin, that membrane yeah. is so, so thin. So the do? water ruins it if you do it too soon. So you get this little container. You put your berries in here. You take this to work, to the park, to wherever, and then you rinse the berries out in there. And it also keeps them elevated so that they're not sitting in the liquid. Oh, okay. Kind of cool so like that, that keeps them from going bad? It keeps them from going bad, so you can wash them on the go. And it also comes with a little spoon, like, or a little but, fork. Oh, and when you That's say you wash your berries too soon, <laughs> should you wait a couple days before you wash no, your berries? No, so only wash them just as you're about to eat the them. The ones you're going to eat? Yes. Oh. Yeah, just like as you eat okay. them.
nutritionist Joy Bauer is here to share some simple and healthy recipes that you can treat yourself to this weekend. And I'm going to start with what I'm calling a frozen key lime pie bar. Okay, and it's got all good. the feels sweet and tart and citrusy. I think you're going to love it. So okay. the star of the show is Greek yogurt. And I'm mm. using 2%, not non-fat, because it freezes a little bit better. Okay. And I'm adding in some lime juice, of course, a little bit of honey to sweeten it up, and then lime zest, because mm. that's going to mm. sort of bring it home. It's going to give it a real limey consistency. I mean, a flavor. Mm -hmm. And it also makes it smell so darn good. And you get that, the specks of the green, which are so pretty. Then I'm going to take, because every key lime pie has a crust, yeah, so I've got like some graham, graham crackers. Are we allowed to eat graham crackers? You are. This is healthy-ish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking half of my crushed graham crackers, oh, and I'm in. going to... Nice. I mix it right in, and now I'm going to do something super cool. So I have a baking sheet that I lined with parchment paper, and it's important to have a lip on the edge of the baking sheet, and I take my batter... And you're just going to pour it right on top of that baking sheet because this is going to go in the freezer for about four hours to overnight. Okay, the whole thing will. Yeah. You got to make this. And uh, you smooth it out. And you don't have to uh, cover the whole baking mm -hmm. sheet because you really want it to be about a quarter of an inch in thickness. Okay. So you get nice pieces of bark. Yum. And now I'm going to top it because we've got a lot left over really with cute. my graham yeah. cracker. Isn't this nice. cute? And this it, is so creative. You, you stash it in the freezer. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Okay. And it comes out like this. Mm. And you break off pieces. Mm. And you have like a huge big bag of pieces. Yeah. And what I then like to do is just to save space in the freezer, I break off all, mm -hmm. all my pieces and I stash them in That's a like bag. Yummy, and then, then you keep them in the freezer. Yes, and it melts in your mouth. It tastes like key lime ice cream, really. Oh, and every wow. once in a while, you get a bite of that lime zest pop mm. and also the graham cracker. It's really sensational. Oh, wow. you got to try idea. it. Okay, so Love this it. one is done, done, and done. Now let's do some done. cookie bars. Yeah. I wanted to create a version that didn't have any egg, and I think I nailed it. Okay. So right over here, I have um, this. This is It's stiffened up a little bit, but it's cashew butter. So I oh. take cashew butter and I mix it with a little bit of vanilla extract and some maple syrup. Mm -hmm. This is almond flour. And the mm -hmm. nice part about almond flour is it's moist. So I work it right in. So I know you're not supposed my... to eat uncooked like white flour. Is almond flour okay? Uh, this almond flour, it's blanched and it also goes under the name of almond meal and it's perfectly fine. Okay. Yes. So I'm mixing this in. And so now you know this is loaded with protein and fiber and all of the deliciousness from the cashew butter. And truth be told, you can swap in peanut butter if you want, but you're going to have a much more peanut butter mm -hmm. forward experience, which is never a bad thing. Right, right. <laughs> and so you mix this up. I don't have time to fully mix it, but it gets very crumbly, just like cookie dough. Mm -hmm. Then you add in your chocolate chips, and I'm going to show you what it looks like, and you press it into... That's so the right cashew over butter here. doesn't make it taste like cashews? Like it actually tastes like cookie dough? It tastes like cookie dough because it's a nice mild butter. Mm -hmm. um, and it's pretty readily available in the grocery store. It's a little bit pricier than peanut butter though. So if you do want to swap in any other nut butter, it will work. Mm -hmm. okay. And so here... I lined an 8x8 eight eight pan with parchment paper mm -hmm. and I pressed in all of my dough. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to, we, we got to take it home though. So I melted some mm. semi sweet or a dark chocolate on top. And I also this added a little like bit of the nut butter. It for does. You, Joy. It, seems, it feels naughty. <laughs> <laughs> this is worth every single delicious bite. <laughs> oh my gosh, we can't. Get, Ian's been calling it dessert for breakfast Friday. <laughs> wow. That looks amazing. Okay, so we have Try this. It. So those white little then, flecks in there, that's the flour? That's. So you can have some flex. So, you know what? For this one, I actually used a chunky cashew butter. So oh, you're seeing oh, little, okay. yeah, little pieces of the cashew. And then this Yum. goes right in the refrigerator, and it firms up in a couple of hours. And I'm going to show you what it looks like because I have some that are done over here. You could tell we oh, wow. dug into it a little bit, yeah, I know. but you 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 cut it right up. Oh, that looks and guys, crazy. It's it's the best contrast yeah. because the middle really does taste like cookie dough, yeah. and then the, and the, the top part is. Oh, treat. Joy, oh my thank gosh. you yeah. so much. We mm. wish you were here.
Good Tuesday morning. Extreme weather sweeping across the country. And now it's causing chaos at the nation's airports. It's June the 27th. This is today. Gridlock. Thousands of flights canceled or delayed with severe storms on the move. Branches are falling up the trees right now. While across the south, that dangerous heat wave only intensifying. It's never been this bad. Tens of millions.